good so now we are uh, recording and well hello Barry good afternoon hi uh, hi just a second yeah the camera. camera is not working just a second yeah no problem in the meantime if you I mean yeah if you can uh, try to share a screen just to test your oh, okay. hello camera is not working hi good hi let me just check yeah sorry sorry i uh, connected late no no problem uh, okay because if we see that there may be some problem with the slides then automatically you should send the pdf so in that case Okay, we but can help. you can see uh, yeah. now that I'm sharing. Yes, uh, let's see. You can, uh, yeah, maximize. Well, but it will be okay. It will be okay. Good. So you come, Barry, in the first after coffee break, right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, five, five fifty-five. Yes, something. yes. In the first after coffee break, which can be around six or five fifty-five, six at most, we can okay, be okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, two minutes to go. Let's see if someone else comes. So just a first question, Rodrigo, do you know how many streams already have been detected with Gaia? Yeah, oh, uh, More or less? yeah um, I, the thing is there are lots. Mm. Right? Uh, and so, yeah, it, it really depends just, you know, how far down the significance threshold do you go, right? Mm. Especially, yeah, I'm going to show this mm. as you look towards the galactic bulges, just like you know, the streams oh. everywhere. But they are out to hundred. Um, yeah, tens. so probably so one of the good ones that you can use for, um, yeah, for, for probing the potential. There's probably a couple of dozen, mm. uh, and uh, but many, may, maybe maybe more. Uh, it it really depends, uh, you know. And things are just going to get better by uh, actually quite a large margin as uh, you know as the next data releases come. Okay. Because nice. it, it's essentially a contrast problem, right? Yeah, with with the stars of the of the, of the background of, of the well, yeah, foreground, foreground, <laughs> foreground, foreground. Yeah. Both actually. Yeah. Uh, hi, Pratika. Hello. Well, uh, we okay. Le hello. We should, hello. Hi. Yes, uh, we should start uh, and uh, hope. Uh, in the meantime, Pratika, if you want, you can send your PDF by email. Uh, so Sorry, if, Carlo, if I share my screen or not the preferred option? Well, 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 yes, if you want to share fast, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. So then that would be perfect. Yes, please. Ah, no, no, no. Of course, you will share for presenting. No, I was saying that uh, because we, we have to start now the session with Rodrigo, but. Uh, mm -hmm the unfortunate case that your slides don't work or some problem with internet. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. I will mail it to you. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, if you want to start the presenting, Rodrigo, we can start. Yep. I'll just do that. So, uh, here we go. Good. So, it's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to present uh, the invited talk of Rodrigo Ibata, 
Um, and he will speak about learned properties of our galaxies that are matter with stellar streams from Universitas Strasbourg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon. And uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying this uh, this this meeting, uh, learning lots of uh, lots of things, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so this this work I'm be talking about this afternoon is uh, has been done with uh, this this group of uh, of good friends and collaborators, and uh, what we what we're trying to do here is trying to see what we can uh, whether we can use the streams that we're finding in the Milky Way to to probe dark matter, uh, and so hopefully it's of of interest to this group. Uh, and so my outline is going to be like this. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to, um, to, to stellar streams and how they relate to the dark matter question. Uh, and then I'll mention briefly how we actually go about finding these streams nowadays with this beautiful uh, data from Gaia that is shown here in the background. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, some new um, advances we're doing, trying to uh, understand streams uh, using uh, machine learning. And so, of course, I mean, in this, this for this particular group, uh, there's uh, really little point in, uh, in 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 saying why 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 this is interesting. But I, I think uh, basically is that you know our theories of dark matter and gravity and you know the various alternatives uh, that have been proposed uh, effectively make some sort of predictions about uh, the accelerations that you're going to get throughout a galaxy. But the problem is that these accelerations generally in those regions of the galaxy. Uh, that are dark matter dominated are going to be very, very difficult to, to, uh, to observe directly because we don't measure accelerations, we measure positions and velocities, of course, uh, or proper motions. Um, and so either you uh, find a way for humans to live a very, very long time, wait a few million years and just see how things uh, move across the sky, um, or you, you have to be cleverer, right? And so over the decades, uh, what people have been doing is to, to assume that, you know, galactic structures are equilibrium structures. And so then you apply something like, for instance, the genes analysis or, or uh, approaches such as these. Uh, but the, the problem, one of the problems with this is that, you know, thanks to the really beautiful data that we're now getting with, with Gaia, we actually uh, we directly see that the Milky Way isn't in equilibrium. So this little plot down here is, shows this very famous phase space uh, spiral that you see by looking at, at stars around the solar neighborhood. And so, okay, so the Milky Way isn't, uh, isn't in equilibrium. So are we just stuck? Is there anything we can do? And so this is where, where streams come in uh, because basically because uh, streams more or less uh, uh, delineate orbits in, in the sky. Um, and so, the, the point here is that obviously if we had, you know, some, some path um, over time, uh, we had an orbit and then we'd know the dynamics through our, through our system. We don't have that, but we have, you know, these structures, things like globular clusters, dwarf galaxies that lose stars. And the, the stars come out from, the, 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 from these satellites with relatively small uh, energies compared to the orbital energy of the satellite. And so this means that as the, um, as the mass of these, the, you know, the structures that make the streams uh, goes to zero, then the, um, you know, the, 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 the paths of the, uh, of, of the streams approximate more and more uh, a, an orbit on, on the sky. So that's the reason I think that uh, stellar streams are interesting. They also trace the buildup of the galaxy. Um, they allow us to get around this issue of equilibrium dynamics. They also retain some, some memory of what's been around in the, in the halo as they've been orbiting. Uh, you know, they can interact with the disk, the bar, satellites, and so on. And they'll retain this information. We may be able to tease this out of the, uh, out of the, uh, out of the data. And they also work as seismometers, as I'll come to in a, in a, in a moment. So how, how do we actually go about finding them, right? So we've got this beautiful new data set from Gaia, so two billion stars or thereabouts, and somewhere hidden among these two billion stars are, are, are these streams. And so uh, with my uh, PhD student, Cathy Malhan, we, we, we put a lot of effort into trying to devise a sort of optimized way of finding these things. And so we imagine here having some, well, essentially what we built was a, you know, a friend finder. Um, where we look at every star in the galaxy and turn each one of these two billion stars. 
uh, and then we try out a plausible orbit for it. Um, in those situations where we're missing information, for instance, where, we, where we're missing radio velocity information, we just sort of scan through all the missing, uh, the, the, through, through the missing dimension. And then we try and see if, um, you know, around a given star, there are other things that you could, uh, that you could match up. Um, so we sort of make a, a smeared out uh, a stream model. And then we, we figure out a, a, a likelihood that depends then on, on, the, astrom on the astrometric uh, measurements and on the, the color magnitude measurements from, from Gaia. And so this gives us a, a likelihood uh, that allows us to make sort of streams, uh, sorry, maps of streaminess in, in, in the galaxy. And so the results as of the, the latest um, data release from Gaia back in December uh, look like this. So this is us hunting through the, the full sky and, and picking out things that, uh, that our, our algorithm tells us are 10 sigma detections. And you see all these beautiful structures here, very clearly correlated in, in proper motion. This is, um, you know, these are um, you know, galactic longitude and latitude and the colors here uh, um, show either um, New direct, uh, so the proper motion in the along the B direction or on the the L direction. So sort of zooming into this little region over here and the uh, just south of the galactic bulge, for instance, is just uh, answering a, a question that Carlos uh, asked me just just before during uh, just before the the talk. Uh, you know, you can see in in this small region, you know, tons and tons of new new streams come uh, pop up at a slightly lower uh, detection threshold. And we've been obtaining VLT data following these objects up, and uh, so far every single every single structure that we followed, I think without exception, has been has been real. You know, you get the radio clear radio velocity gradient. So these were the maps between uh, three and twelve kiloparsecs, and then we can do the same thing. So we're going from slightly further out and find more and more structures. Um, so you know this, the, you know, it would require probably several. <laughs> Uh, several talks to to go through the, these various objects, and so I, I'm not going to do that today. Um, I should mention, though, that we've been uh, yes, well, we've been getting radio velocity measurements at high resolution with uh, with with the VLT, and they, um, they they show these structures to be always uh, kinematically coherent. But let's let's sort of think about what we can what we can do with this with this data set and. In, in, in this particular meeting, what, uh, what we'd like to know is, um, you know, what are these telling us about the, about the dark matter? And so 20 years ago now, we, a whole bunch of, of different groups came up with the same idea at the same time, which was that, you know, you could use these, these streams to try and probe the lumpiness of the halo. Uh, and in our own particular simulations, what, what we showed was that, uh, you know, a, a stream, as soon as you put in cold dark matter lumps at, at the time uh, that, that were um, with, with the number that were expected at the time, um, you, you'd expect to get some sort of uh, kinematic heating of these, of these streams. Um, Ray Karlberg back in 2012 um, showed that in fact it was going to be much more, uh, much, much easier to, to make these measurements if you looked for gaps in streams. So the idea here is, here is that you have a, a stream going through the halo and some, uh, some sub halo comes past and then perturbs the streams. And so they, they, the stars sort of bunch up in certain places, uh, producing, uh, uh, producing gaps. And so this is taken on. And uh, uh, one of the, the really interesting objects, I mean, we can do this sort of analysis on all of these structures, but one of the ones for which we have the, better, the best data is this object here, GD1. And you can, that's one of the longer highest contrast uh, streams uh, that have been found. And so there was this nice paper by by Panic and collaborators, uh, where they they do this on uh, on GD one. So what what they show us here are the uh, are the counts um, as a function of angle along the stream. And you can see all this sort of bumpy behavior, sort of suggestive of uh, of you know gaps in, in 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 the stream. And they run the same thing with with some simulations. So they put in a uh, you know in a smooth halo, and you don't see these bumps and then you can put in sort of the, the effect of bars and spirals and so on. And again, you don't see this, this, lumpy, this lumpy structure. So then they take the, the data and um, derive the, the density power spectrum uh, for the stars along the leading arm of this, this, particular, um, this particular stream and the trailing arm. 
and these are shown here by these 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 dots with with error bars um, and they compare this to their simulations without lambda cdm lumps and that's what these uh, these colored lines are here along with the uncertainties and they 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 claim then that um, that without lambda uh, lcdm lumps well you just don't get you don't have the same sort of power in the um, of, of in, in in the density power spectrum and it's only once you put in some uh, some cold dark matter subhalos that you can get the two things to, to the, you can get the simulations to match the uh, the observations and so then this um, implies a, a um, an incidence of uh, of, of subhalos of about um, forty percent of well, 40% with these uncertainties compared to, to what is expected. So uh, we, we took a look at this uh, also with, uh, with uh, pretty much the same data, uh, just, uh, but we, we, made some, we made our own, um, our own samples um, based on, on, on our stream detection software and some other sort of more traditional approaches. And I won't go through this, uh, in, in any detail, but just to mention that one of the things that we were able to do was measure the distance to the uh, to this particular stream as a function of angle along the stream, and we, we could measure this really quite accurately, as well as everything else. As you can see here, we have proper motions, we have um, radio velocities along the stream, and so on. And then this allows us to make a just in the same way as Bannock and collaborators, uh, we can we can. Um, we can show then the, you know, the the density as a function of position along the stream, and then derive the density power spectrum uh, as again just like Banach as a function of inverse wave number in degree, so as a function of angle, um, and we get something a result that is very similar to to what they found. But interestingly, because we also have the uh, the distances, we can show exactly the same thing. But now, instead of uh, as a function of degrees, we look at it uh, as a function of um, in 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 real uh, in, in real distance. And the point here is that the this the structure isn't actually perpendicular to the line of sight; it has an angle. And once we do that, you see that the uh, there's this very large peak that pops out uh, that corresponds to, to to these peaks here. But it's just that they're, they're all separated by a very nice two and a half kiloparsecs. And so either um, you know, the subhalos are passing by in such a way that they give precisely a two and a half kiloparsec uh, interval between the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the peaks, or much more likely, we think it's this is just a, uh, a case of epicycles in streams. And uh, this is exact. In fact, the, the distance that you find for these uh, th between the epicyclic peaks is pretty much what you'd find from a simple estimate of uh, the, the mass of, the, of this particular object. Uh, and so this might actually be a bit of a problem for, uh, for, for the subhalos in the sense that, you know, once you put in the, um, you put in the, 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 the um, you essentially you're able to get what you see without any any subhalos being there. So then I'll just go on to uh, the final part of my talk uh, on uh, on the, the the work we've been doing uh, trying to uh, use streams uh, within a machine learning context to try and derive the the properties of uh, of the Milky Way. And so uh, let's go back to the beginning and uh, you know with. Um, I, I'm going to start from the, the point of view of, uh, of Hamiltonian dynamics, and I, I guess Hamilton, as soon as he wrote down his his uh, his equations, must have immediately recognized that there was something really cute here. Uh, if you could find uh, a uh, if you could find some coordinates um, in which the the Hamiltonian uh, didn't have any uh, dependence on uh, on 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 position, then you know, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the position would then just be zero. Uh, and then you'd have your conjugate momenta um, when you integrated this up to, to find the, you know, the properties uh, uh, as a function of time would just be constant, right? So he must have immediately realized that, uh, that, that, that this, this, this would have been, a, you know, a, a really, really handy uh, uh, coordinate system to find. And so something I didn't realize was that right from the very beginning, Hamilton and, and Jacobi uh, well, went out to, to search for this. 
uh, and they they propose this sort of a generating function of approach uh, to try and find uh, this 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 transformation. And so the what what they what they tried to do was to to find a uh, a transformation between the sort of the um, the coordinates which which you know for a, for a system and and some new coordinates uh, as formed by a generating function s which happens to have these these particular properties here um, and a couple of lines of algebra using hamilton's um, hamilton's principle shows you then that the the new uh, the new coordinates have exactly the uh, in in these new coordinates um, Hamilton's equations have exactly the same form, the same canonical form as the original ones. Uh, and so this turns out obviously to, to, be, to be very handy because if you can then uh, find the, the, the generating function that gives you a, uh, um, um, a uh, transformed Hamiltonian that has no um, dependence on Q, then very beautifully you see that the, in, in that particular coordinate system, uh, your your positions just advance linearly in time, and the conjugate momenta are all constant. And so, you know, this is this would be really beautiful if we could do this for uh, uh, for for systems of interest. But of course, you know, most of the time this s happens to be basically impossible to to measure, right, or to to derive. It's just really really hard. Now, these these special coordinates, of course, are what people have come to call action angle coordinates. And so, just to just to reiterate what I just said, you know, some some sort of orbit in the, in, in normal space then just sort of uh, has has this property of having of just being a straight line in, in actions and angles, and they're they're becoming um, very uh, very popular in 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 the work on on galactic dyma dynamics because of this fact that they're uh, um, they're adiabatic invariant. So as the galaxy changes adiabatically through time. Uh, these uh, the actions are conserved, and because of this, it sort of makes them the ideal coordinates also for galactic archaeology. So uh, we tried to see whether um, over the last year we've been actually building this uh, the, uh, a series of, of tools to be able to do this. Essentially, trying to realize uh, the the you know the this this aim that that Hamilton and Jacobi had two hundred years ago. Um, and, and the idea here was just to, to use the power of, uh, of, of machine learning now to build these, these generating functions. So essentially what we do is to, um, is, is we, we, we allow, we get the data to, to learn a, a deep neural net for this generating function that allows it to go from some uh, observations to actions and angles using an objective function uh, that is essentially just that the at the end of this process the uh, the actions have to be have to be the same on each one of the the orbits that we feed into the system, and this actually turns out to work. Um, and the really nice thing about this is that we don't have to either input the potential or the Hamiltonian. We don't have to provide a symmetry to the system, and we actually derive the acceleration field directly from this. Um, so how well does it work? I and mean, you can get you know. If we give it something like eight thousand points in uh, uh, for disk orbits, you get these actions to ridiculous uh, level of accuracy, uh, much better than you can ever measure with Gaia, for instance. You can plug it into embodied models, um, and these are some some tests we did in the paper. Um, by the way, the uh, the, the, the software is given here on on GitHub. Um, and most recently, we've been playing around with this a little bit more, actually adding in. Um, adding in time into the uh, in, into this generating function, and so this is the one one of the toy cases that we've been trying over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and what it is is a, is is um, an orbit. Uh, sorry, it's, it's a yes, it's an orbit in in, in a uh, in in a potential that has a rotating bar, uh, and you can see um, it's it's a star that goes would go through the uh, the, the galactic uh, sorry through the solar neighborhood. And in the rotating frame, it has this really weird shape here, and we can recover for the first time actually the uh, the actions of, uh, of of orbits in 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 a system such as this. Another really neat thing that I got very excited about last week was uh, trying to play with a, a system, a, a three-body system, where you have the Milky Way, 
uh, the large Magellanic Cloud and the Sagittarius Dwarf, and you play the game of observing the Sagittarius Dwarf from the position of the Milky Way. Um, but of course, the, you know, the Milky Way's potential is changing because of the arrival of the LMC. And so this system then has to build up a, a generating function that is able to make this coordinate transformation from positions, velocities to actions and angles um, as a function of time. So it has to know how the, the system was in the past and able to do it with 1% you know, scatter. So essentially you have a, a picture of the past um, mass distribution in the Milky Way. So I'm really excited to be able to, uh, to you know, to view this in, in the future put it, uh, and, and, and try it out with real data. And we're also doing, right now, we're, we're also, uh, we, we've also found out, thanks to uh, an insight by Sanders and Binney, how to actually fit streams rather than just orbits. So just wrapping all of that up, um, I think uh, you know, it's, it's really exciting to be able to use uh, stellar streams uh, to, to probe the dark matter. We've seen that in the case of GD1, the, you know, there's a very periodic uh, signal in the, in the density um, along, the, along the stream. So this is almost certainly not due to, uh, um, to subhalos flying by unless something really weird is going on. And we've been building this uh, a series of machine learning tools to, uh, to try and make this, uh, this canonical transformation between positions and actions and angles. Um, and we can do this now. It works really nicely. It recovers the acceleration field. Um, and uh, you know, now we're even being able to, we've, we've seen that we can even put in time dependence. And so I think this really opens up a, a whole new field. Uh, I, I'm really excited about this. And in the future, what, what we'll be doing over the next couple of years is trying to confront uh, the measurements that hopefully we'll be getting with, uh, from the streams. Uh, to predictions of uh, of what streams should look like, what they uh, you know, what in in different theories of dark matter and gravity. So, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Rodrigo. Uh, just in time, just a couple of only two minutes, uh, one minute uh, ahead. So we we have we'll have five minutes for questions. And thanks a lot for this very very amazing last result that you have shown that surprised me. Uh, well, this was the, the, the paper I talked to you uh, just prior to that I was referring, uh, but now you you clear much more to me the view. Uh, okay, so uh, there are any questions? Is there any raised hand? Or if you just have a question, please, uh, I can, uh, you can reactivate the audio. Yes. Mark? So, yeah, thank you very much for this talk. So what exactly are these cycles then? You say that they're not, or you can imagine a situation where you have some filament from outside the halo that's throwing subhalos at some particular uh, location of the central halo. But if that's not it, what, what do you think the, um, what you call the echo cycles actually is? Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so in this simulation here, for instance, this is of, um, I, I think in this particular case by, by Andreas Cooper, um, who pointed out the existence of these things a, a few years ago. It's, it's th these things just, um, you know, they, they, they just occur because uh, the, the stars are coming out with slightly different velocities. Uh, and so they, they pile up at the, this region in the, um, in, in the tail where they sort of loop around <laughs> in, the, uh, in this rotating frame. Um, so it's and, internal uh, kinematics of the satellite as it's falling in. Yeah, so it's, it, it's just the behavior of, uh, you know, stars that are going out on slightly different, uh, with, with slightly different uh, um, energy, well, well, on slightly different orbits. And they just happen to pile up in some, in some locations. Okay, thanks. So it's, so it's more of a wave, really, through the uh, um, through the stream. Is there any other yeah, Druva? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rodrigo. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, so I had uh, I was wondering one thing, which is uh, um, so you know the uh, you know the present. Uh, like the the phase space coordinates for the streams, and then you have a you have a model with subhalos or without subhalos. 
So you need to assume something for the initial phase space coordinates, right? So uh, how sensitive or how like degen so what is the level of degeneracy uh, with respect to the initial phase space coordinates for the streams that uh, you need to assume? I, I so, do you mean in the modeling? Yeah, in the modeling. Yeah, in in the the, the machine. Uh, I mean, in, in in this modeling here, you mean? Uh, so I was I was talking thinking about the previous stuff, the like the uh, in body modeling or like the potential. So you have a smooth potential, and then you uh, have a um, perturbations from the clumps, right, which are the subhalos. So that that's your potential model. And then uh, you have the data, which is the current or present day observed phase space coordinates of the streams. Now you need to assume something for the initial phase space coordinates, right? So the model transforms the initial phase space coordinates to the current phase space coordinates. So I was wondering how much, so how, first of all, like how do you choose the initial coordinates? And then what is sort of the level of degeneracy there? Like, I guess if you choose different initial coordinates, then, uh, Yes, I, 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 I guess you mean. Um, so the, so what, what's happening, for instance, in this case of uh, of, of this GD one uh, structure as modelled by by Bannock and collaborators is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So in 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 terms of the of, of the GD one stream itself, I, I think we can go back quite a long uh, time and sort of know fairly well what what it's been doing, right? Um, of course, what's harder is to know what all the invisible stuff is, is up to. And so what, I think what they what they did here uh, was to to run a series of simulations um, of you know, just essentially drawing um, sub halos with with the sort of expected Phase space um, okay. structure that 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 you 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 gain from from the cosmological simulations, um, mm -hmm. but I, I I must admit I I mean I I didn't do this particular work so I'm not exactly exactly sure what they did. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good. Uh, we can continue then with questions uh, to the discussion session and let's move to um, Pratika. Uh, please, if you start, want to start to share slides. Great. Sorry, uh, Carlos, can I please ask, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can see your slides. Very okay. good. So, well, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, now it's a pleasure to present uh, Pratika Dayal from uh, Groningen. Uh, she will talk about constraints on the nature of warm dark matter from the first billion years. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so thank you all for being here. And uh, what I would like to do today is really to try and give you a very rough idea of the kind of constraints that we can actually infer on the nature of warm dark matter from the high redshift universe. So um, going from the Milky Way, I'm going to really zoom back in time. And the epoch that I'm going to focus on is really the epoch of reionization and the epoch of the formation of the first stars and galaxies. And so just to put this into a cosmological context, um, I'm going to focus on galaxies that formed at a redshift of around 30 down to a redshift of about five and six. And the key motivation of these uh, sort of projects that we have been doing is that I think you're all really well aware of the fact that cold dark matter is really enormously successful when we try and explain large scale structures. However, there are a number of small scale problems that cannot be um, really easily solved by baryonic feedback alone. And so there is the second school of thought which says, well, yeah, okay, maybe we can try to see what, what, uh, what happens if we can actually change the nature of dark matter itself. And so this is basically, this was our key motivation to, to, uh, to do these sorts of projects. And the second motivation was the fact that as of now, all the constraints that we have on the warm dark matter particle mass, which are roughly somewhere between two and a half to three and a half kV, come from the low redshift Lagan alpha forest. So this is the Lagan alpha forest at redshifts below four and a half. So above this redshift, as of now, really, we don't have any direct constraints or complementary constraints on the nature of this warm dark matter. And so what I would like to show you today is how we can actually use the data we have now or the models that we are 
we are baselining against all available data that, that exist, can actually be used to extend these constraints on the warm dark matter particle mass to, some, to the first billion years. Okay, so well, a very quick introduction to the team who has been working on high wedge of galaxy formation and the epoch of reionization. And I would like to especially point out my student, Jonas Bremer. So he's a PhD student who has been working on, on the warm dark matter aspect. And of course, a lot of what we are doing is baseline against data that we have from a number of instruments, such as the HST and ALMA, as we look towards the era of SKA, LISA, and, and Euclid. Okay, so before I start, of course, the question will be how much data do we actually have about the high redshift universe that we can actually talk about baselining anything to, to the high redshift universe. So in 2009, there was a sort of revolution in the field of high redshift galaxy formation because the wide field camera three was installed on the Hubble Space Telescope. And since then, we have accumulated data on around 9,000 galaxies at redshifts above five. So we do have a lot of statistically significant data to be able to create what we call both global properties and to understand the properties of individual galaxies. So today I'm not going to go into the ISM properties like dust and emission lines, but I'm just going to stay more on, on the lines of the global properties. But just to give you a very broad idea from all of this data that we have, we have been able to construct ultraviolet luminosity functions. So these are luminosity functions centered at roughly 1250 angstrom in the rest frame of the galaxy. So what I'm showing you here is just the number density of galaxies for moving megaparsec as a function of the UV magnitude. And you can see that this extends really, so this is at a redshift of seven. And as you can see, this extends now over really an enormous range, which is between magnitudes of roughly minus 14 all the way through to magnitudes of minus 23. So it's, it's really nine magnitudes that we have been able to, uh, to span. So of course, at the bright end, this data is collected from ground-based instruments. However, at the low mass end, this is the collection, this is data that is, these are basically lensed galaxies caught by the HST. So it's basically because of lensing that we have been able to push really faint. And if you're interested, these galaxies roughly correspond to halo masses of about 10 to the 9 solar masses. So this is really incredible because for the first time, we're able to to really look at these galaxies all the way from halo masses of roughly 10 to the 9 through to 10 to the 11 and a half or 10 to the 12 solar masses. With this data, the second thing that we have been able to do, so another, the second global property, which I think is really crucial, is the total stellar mass density. So how much stellar mass do we have per co-moving volume as a function of redshift? So this is what I'm showing you here in this second plot. So this is the uh, yeah, stellar mass density per co moving megaparsec cube as a function of redshift. And as you can see, all of the points here that you, that you see are actually observations. And of course, there is a magnitude cut, which is generally, uh, generally applied, which corresponds to a UV magnitude, an absolute UV magnitude of roughly minus 70. So we're basically integrating this part of the luminosity function, if you will. So it's basically, we are not looking at really the faintest galaxies because it has been incredibly hard to pin down their stellar masses. The third thing, of course, that we are interested in is to understand how does the star formation rate of the density of the universe actually evolve? So what I'm showing you here in this plot is the star formation rate per co-moving volume as a function of redshift. Interestingly here, things break, break down a little bit at super, super high redshifts. So if you look at redshifts between roughly up to a redshift of roughly eight, then all of these, um, all of the different star formation rate densities actually agree quite well with each other. However, uh, once you go to redshifts above eight, observationally, we really don't have a type constraint on how the star formation rate density is evolving. So if you can see all of these data points, they seem to cover quite a large parameter space, the upper limits. And this is dependent on whether they are from lensing or they are from ground-based observations. But in any case, it suffices to say that as of now, the star formation rate density remains quite poorly understood. So it could either evolve as one plus z to the power minus four, or it could evolve as steeply as one plus z to the power minus 12. So this is just to really give you an idea that the star formation rate density really remains, remains poorly constrained, at least, especially at these very high redshifts. And of course, to talk more in terms of the morphologies, um, I'm not going to do that, but just to give you an idea that we also have been able to probe the size evolution of these galaxies up to, uh, up to redshifts of, of, uh, of even seven. 
So I hope this sort of gives you an idea of the kind of statistics and the kind of physical properties that we can actually probe for these high wedge of galaxies. And with this in mind, let me now start the actual part of the talk, which is what, what can we actually do with them? So this is a merger tree in our standard cold dark matter paradigm where the, the particle mass is roughly 100 GeV, for example. So we start with low mass halos at high redshift. So here I started a redshift of 20, just as an illustrative example. These low mass halos grow through mergers and through accretion to form you know, some sort of a halo by a redshift of, for example, six. The situation changes a little bit if you invoke uh, warm, light warm dark matter. So this is warm dark matter, which has a particle mass of three kV. And as you can already imagine, the lighter is the warm dark matter particle mass that you invoke, the more is the suppression of structure, especially on small scales. So as an illustrative example, you see here that there are all of those low mass halos, which could actually form in the cold dark matter paradigm can no longer form just because of the suppression or the, the pressure that you have from these light warm dark matter particles. Let me show you what happens if you invoke an even lighter warm dark matter particle. Of course, you erase out even more structure in the high redshift universe. But what is actually crucial to note is that if you have to assemble a galaxy of a given, of a given halo mass, this naturally means that it's going to start off from much larger progenitors. And this is actually a really crucial point that I'm going to touch upon as, as we move on. So now uh, what we have been, been doing is developing these semi-analytic models. And the reason is that we can really have an extremely large range in terms of halo mass. So for the models that we have, we limit them to redshifts above four and a half. And for these, we look at halos all the way between redshifts or uh, between halo masses of 10 to the eight and 10 to the 14 solar masses. So we can really, this is a range that is very hard to explore with, with any kind of numerical simulations. And in these, uh, in our model, so this is called Delhi, we have all the key processes of galaxy formation. So in each halo, you have star formation, which is linked to the halo potential. If you're interested, please ask me more about this later. If you have really, really small halos, you have a small amount of star formation, and those may have enough supernova feedback to basically kick out the rest of the gas. And so these will result in dry mergers. However, their successor can actually gain some amount of dark matter and gas through smooth accretion from the IGN. On the other hand, you can have a different branch in which halos are assembling for much larger, you have much larger halos. And so these are not feedback limited. So you have wet mergers. Again, you have some amount of smooth accretion, et cetera. So in this model, we have really all the key processes of star formation, supernova feedback, mergers, accretion. So now let me just show you what actually happens. So this is how the assembly of a galaxy would look like in the standard cold dark matter paradigm. As we have discussed in the warm dark matter paradigm, you would just erase out some of these low mass structures or these low mass halos that you could actually form in the cold dark matter paradigm. Basically what this, so let me just translate this into what, what this means for the stellar mass, which is an actually measurable quantity. So what I'm showing you here is the total stellar mass that has been assembled as a function of redshift. This is for a galaxy with a stellar mass of 10 to the nine and a half solar masses, which is quite a typical value at a redshift of uh, four and a half. The solid black line shows the assembly of this galaxy in the, in the standard cold dark matter paradigm. So for example, such a galaxy would start assembling somewhere around a redshift of 15 and the shaded regions that you see are the one sigma error bars because we are averaging out over millions of, of these galaxies which we have in our simulation. Now, if I invoke warm dark matter, which is 5 keV, um, for all practical purposes, anything which is heavier than 3 keV basically starts to look the same as cold dark matter. So what you can easily see here is that the, the assembly of such a stellar mass is very similar to between the three uh, between the, the 5 keV and the cold dark matter paradigm. There is a slight delay if you invoke a warm dark matter mass of 3 kV, although this is going from a redshift of 15 to a redshift of 13. So it's a slight delay within error bars. It's, it's basically indistinguishable. However, if you invoke warm dark matter of a particle mass, which is one and a half kV, then what you start to see immediately is that basically this, is, this has suppressed all those low mass halos, which were forming at really high redshifts. And so the assembly of this galaxy is now starting much, much later at a redshift of about eight. So this delay between the one and a half kV assembly and the CDM assembly 
is roughly on the order of 400 million years. Now you can say, well, 400 million years is not a lot, but remember that in the first billion years of the universe, this is actually 40% of the age of, of the universe. And so this is actually one of the reasons that we are trying to do all of this at high redshift because we can really see the imprint of the lag or, or yeah, of, of these low mass halos in contributing to the star formation. So effectively, what this results in that, that mass to light ratios are basically dependent on cosmology. So this is the stellar mass as a function of UV magnitude, so basically just the mass to light ratio. And what you can clearly see here is that CDM, which is the black line, 3 kV and 5 kV, which are the red and the blue lines, basically look the same for, for galaxies, um, even if you consider UV magnitudes between minus 14 to minus 23 or so, they look very, very similar. The points that you see here are the data and the yellow points are the, are the averages of the data. And so in principle, yeah, we can, um, all of these different models, anything heavier than 3 kV is basically the same as your cold dark matter paradigm. However, when you look at the one and a half kV model, what is basically happening is that for a given stellar mass, the stellar population is slightly younger, which means it is actually slightly more luminous. So this is exactly the effect that you are seeing that for a given stellar mass, galaxies are just slightly brighter in the one and a half kV paradigm. So what does this actually mean for observation? So let me show you what people have been doing in this, in this field. Um, one thing, the simplest thing you can actually do is to take a halo mass function in a given cosmology, scale it with a constant mass to light ratio and see what the UV luminosity function would look like. So again, this is the luminosity function. So number density of galaxies per co-moving megaparsec cube as a function of the UV magnitude. Um, all of these points that you see here are the data points that I showed you before. If you do a simple scaling, so you say mass to light ratios are independent of cosmology. I use the same mass to light ratio for every cosmological model. Basically, you see that for the one and a half kV scenario, the uh, luminosity function basically starts turning over at a UV magnitude of roughly minus 16. And so a number of groups have made this claim that because the luminosity function starts turning over at a point that we can already see, you can basically rule out one and a half kV warm dark matter. However, the situation is actually much more complex. As I showed you, mass to light ratios are actually really cosmology dependent. So what is happening is that although we have a dearth of low mass galaxies in this one and a half kV model, each galaxy that you do have is just slightly brighter than what it should have been in the standard cold dark matter paradigm because, give, because of a lower mass to light ratio. So if you really jointly track the assembly of of dark matter halos in different cosmologies together with their baryonic component, then it actually erases out some of the difference that you see between these very light warm dark matter and CDM models. So for example, in our model, what we are finding is that the one and a half kV luminosity function and the CDM luminosity function are basically the same down to magnitudes as, as faint as minus 13 and a half or so. And so I think this is really a crucial point that we have to remember that mass to light ratios are really, really going to be dependent on cosmology. And so if you want to do this kind of a, of a calculation, you really have to couple the assembly of dark matter halos together with their variance. So, so as I have already sort of anticipated, um, the assembly of galaxies is delayed in these very light dark matter models. But it is also accelerated because you start from halos, which are actually not very supernova feedback limited. So what I bring you here is the density again. Basically, the same. But you can see the of one and a half model is actually quite different. So it's it's much steeper, basically, uh, because you start off later, but you start off with halos that are not feedback limited. And although we are used to thinking of it um, in these terms, the JWST can actually be a really nice dark matter machine. Because for instance, actually, so my PhD student, Jonas, he had this really nice idea of studying the metal enrichment of the intergalactic medium in these different cosmologies. And again, the idea remains the same. We have used the same semi-analytic model that we had before. But if you remember, uh, we said that in 
cold dark matter, you can have your, your progenitors forming down to basically genes mass. But for, uh, for warm dark matter, the, the mass that can collapse is actually much higher. So effectively, what this means is that galaxies, the highest wedge of galaxies that you are going to assemble in the cold dark matter pipeline. You have three minutes. Okay, I'm going to like wrap up super quickly. Okay. No, it's okay, it's okay, you have three minutes. Three kV looks to the cold dark matter paradigm, and again, the one and a half kV warm dark matter paradigm has a very different slope to CDM and to the three kV model. And all of these points that you see here are actually data points. And as these are going to be extended higher and higher, then in principle, this is another way in which we can start to put constraints on the warm dark matter particle mass. And because I have like probably like one or two minutes, I'm going to like go super quickly and then just tell you a little bit about another really new avenue that has opened up with the detection of a 21 centimeter signal that you might have all heard about. So this is an absorption signal, which is between a ratchet of roughly 17 to 21. So this is the signal that, that has been measured by the EDGES collaboration. It has created a huge impact in our field, um, basically because uh, this is one of the highest redshift signals that we have, it's sky averaged. The validity of the signal remains debatable, but in any case, so let's, let's assume that the signal is, is true. So this is the edges signal. The problem with the signal is that we expected something that was minus 250 millikelvin or so. So this is measured against the CMB. So this is an absorption signal. So this means that the gas you are measuring, the gas temperature is colder than the CMB temperature. So we expected a signal which would be roughly minus 250 millikelvin. What we measure is much, much, uh, much um, has a much higher amplitude, basically by a factor of two. So they have reported the, that this signal is minus 500 millikelvin. Now this creates an enormous problem because this either implies that the gas is actually colder than what we think, or there is some sort of an interaction between the gas and dark matter that maybe we have not thought about, or the nature of dark matter is different. In any case, as I have been showing you from our models, um, well, maybe I should just anticipate a little bit. Uh, the depth of this signal depends on the radio background that you have. So we assume that the background is purely from the CMB, but there could be an additional component from, say, star formation. So let's assume it's from some kind of star formation. And the signal turns up because when you have more and more star formation, then it basically heats up the gas. So the key idea here is that you need star formation to be able to produce the signal in the first place. So what we have done is a really simple calculation where we say, okay, let's look at how much star formation, how much star formation per co-moving volume do we have in all of these different models. So again, this is the same semi-analytic model that I showed you before. So this is the star formation rate density function of redshift. As you can see in CDM three and five kV, you already have star formation in place even at redshift greater than 20. So this plot goes up to a ratchet of 40 even. And so in principle, you can produce the edges signal. However, if you look at the one and a half kV model, then you see that it starts to basically turn down and it basically turns over at a ratchet of roughly 70. So what this means is that if um, we can invoke um, an additional radio background, but this is a secondary issue, but we have enough star formation in CDM to at least be able to explain the redshift at which we see the signal. So again, the black line is the edges signal on which I have plotted all these different results that we have. And the red lines are our model, uh, the, the best fit models that we have. Depending on what kind of a radio background you assume, you can push down the signal even lower. 5K, we managed to, manages to kind of reproduce the signal. In 3K, we have a little bit less star formation, but you still have enough to be at least able to produce a signal, although this neither matches the redshift nor the amplitude of the edges data. But as you saw in the one and a half kV model, we just don't have any star formation at redshifts above 70. And so basically what this means is that there is no way we can match either the redshift or the amplitude 
of the edges signal. So if the edges signal is indeed true, then in principle, you can already start ruling out warm dark matter, which is less than 3 GeV. Of course, there are a number of alternative probes. I think I, I would just like to note these before I just show you my conclusion. So people have been doing a lot of work on using high redshift luminosity functions, GRBs, 21 centimeter statistics, uh, direct collapse black hole formation to, to, to really try and put constraints. And so I think what I've just tried to do is give you a very broad idea of how all of the data that we have available on galaxies, on the IGM, and now even on the 21 centimeter mission from the high redshift universe is all pointing towards this one homogeneous picture where we can basically rule out warm dark matter, which has a mass less than 3 kV. And this is actually fantastic because this is really complementary to the 3.3 kV constraints that we have at much lower redshift. And so in principle, this is actually one of the only ways we have of extending the warm dark matter constraints to epochs that are really inaccessible by any other means. And I will stop here. Thank you for your <laughs> patience with me. Well, uh, Pratika, very nice talk and results. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was nice to hear that the uh, warm dark matter models can also at some point, uh, I don't know if the word is compete, but to uh, challenge, to, to, to compare with the CDM that, uh, mm. uh, and that we can start to constrain particle masses, which by the way, I just want to make a fast comment before questions that I really like to see that it is possible to rule out warm dark matter particles, um, which are uh, complementary and in the in the good direction with respect to ga uh, gun or phase space bounds and also mm. like an alpha forest for the typical yeah. candidates that uh, are rising of few to several keV the lower bounds so these start to be compatible nice compatible yeah okay <laughs> uh, so uh, there are any questions uh, mark yes please thank you to see you again perhaps I'm not sure I've seen you uh, actually seen you in some ways since the last one of these that we did six years ago in Rome. I know. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Um, but with these uh, semi-analytic models, they're produced initially by people who have a bias towards low redshift science, in which mm. you, just, you just imagine that you have these particular halos of dark matter, and mm. then you just start sticking these halos together. But with warm dark matter, we call that matter as well, if you go and back far enough, but particularly with warm dark matter, um, in, rather than having some discrete halo at redshift 10, redshift 12, instead you've got some knots in a series of filaments. And as you showed in our 2019 paper with the ethos SIDM model, that's practically warm dark matter for this conversation. Uh -huh. in, rather than having some halo with gas collecting in the middle and then forming stars, instead you get more ribbons of gas and parts of this ribbon can start forming um, stars. So could you talk, say something about the difference between this standard, standard galaxy formation model of forming things in halos versus knots in WDM? Thanks. Okay, well, that's, that's actually a really nice but a really complicated issue. So Mark, I'm just wondering, you know, like if you had uh, basically these knots, would you, would you not be completely uh, radiative feedback suppressed? You know, because you are going to have radiative feedback well, from, from reionization. So the moment you start producing these halos, if your knots are not heavy enough, would you not just kind of like dissipate them? You know, so this has been always sort of my main concern with this whole star formation in knots. Like how long the, the, uh, the geometry of the filament, isn't it? So obviously there would be certain, so it's easy to form stars for, to have light going out of the filament, but whether you can still bend this, the, the filament uh, spine is still thick enough. But we did it, we, we have simulations where we see some of this, mm. well, let's say. Otherwise, we could, just, otherwise, we would have, we'll have to complain about the fact that you know, we get guillotined at half past seven or so. I wanted to bring that up. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think it's actually a really good point. You know, I'm, I'm just, um, I think we should have a proper discussion later. But just for, for the purposes of this talk, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm really aware of your, all this work you guys have been doing on star formation and filaments. I think it's just once you really start coupling it with reionization feedback, 
I think your, your star formation would not persist as long as it could in halos. You know, and I think this is really a missing component that should be included because even in where well, we have these new simulations, so what I showed is semi-analytic, but we also have new simulations. And what we are finding is that depending on what kind of radiative feedback you choose to implement, you could, in principle, um, photo evaporate the gas mass for halos less than 10 to the nine and a half solar masses. You know, and then my question would be, if you had these filaments, would they be impervious to, to the effect of such radiative feedback? Right, especially now that we have all of the star formation in binary. So in principle, you can have temperatures as high as 30 or 35,000 Kelvin, right? And so this, I think, is basically my main concern, like how impervious would they be to, to radiative feedback? Okay, guys, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so we suggest to continue this nice discussion to the discussion session afterwards. Uh, thank you, Pratik, again for the talk and the, yes, the questions answers and um, well let's please move to omar uh or you. omar if, uh, hola hi hi do you hear me yes do you hear me okay i'm gonna share my screen yes please Do you see? It's all clear? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it's clear. So, uh, so I present Omar de Jesus Cabrera Rosas. Uh, which is your institution, Omar? Uh, Simbestab. Simbestab, yes, sure, from Simbestab. So, he will talk about image information process from the matter for files. You can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to begin. Um, good day to all. Uh, you see here the title of my presentation, Image Information Process for DM Profiles. I'm working right now uh, in Simplestab um, and I'm analyzing this kind of models. Uh, we are trying, uh, I'm going to set the, the goals of the basic questions that uh, we are using for working in this in this field, right? Okay. So the question that is open here right now is what is dark matter? It's a scalar field, a vector field, a tensor field. And this question obviously is not, not uh, I'm not the only one that I'm, I'm answering this question. All we are working here and uh, are answering this, this kind of question, but uh, there are several approaches for understanding what is happening here. So the next question is, what is the M made of? And next, we can ask, are there different types of DM? And next, are there observational trails, optical information for these models? And this question is what we are interested right here in this work. Uh, work. So we are still in search of complete answers, okay? Uh, Hence, uh, basing on a, on a work from Dr. Tonatiu Matos, uh, we analyze several profiles. And here are listed, what are those profiles? Burkert, what means for related to, to dwarf galaxies, multi-state that is related with the scalar fields for finite, temp finite temperature, PI or the pseudo isothermal that is related with their hail models, SPANO, that is the M distribution in spiral galaxies, WDM, that is a model that follows a wavelength dark matter model, and the classic NFW, that is a universal dark matter profile. So uh, if you want to know what happens with this, uh, with the analysis of the dynamics of these profiles, I here is uh, the reference and what we are doing here is to use the basic tool for gravitational lensing to study what is the behavior of these profiles. So I, I'm not gonna uh, do, uh, give you a class of gravitational lensing because in fact, I'm not totally an expert in that area. But what we do, I do know is that the basic equations are these. So we need to find the deflection angle for a lens, a gravitational lens, 
And this is related with the volume density matter distribution in that, uh, in that profile, in that model. And that information is encoded in the surface mass density, that is the second expression there. And the goal is to analyze the lens mapping, the lens equation, that last equation there. And this equation is what defines how are mapped the points, the points, sorry, from the lens plane to the source plane. The important part here is to understand that usually we need the inverse mapping the mapping from the source plane to the lens plane, but that, uh, that equation is very complicated to obtain. So we work with the lens mapping and we analyze the behavior of such equation. Okay. So we use the dimensionless lens equation for these profiles. How is obtained this equation? Well, you define the vectors on each plane, you define the parameters to scale those vectors and you analyze the profile directly. That is the method. Okay, so we take the more simplest case that is actual symmetric lenses. We take the classical formulas that is to obtain the surface mass density, the convergence of the lens, the critical mass surface mass density and the, a dimension, or the dimensionless mass of this system. And we obtain the deflection angle for, for the problem. That is the method. In fact, uh, a quantity that we have uh, seen that is very, very important so far is the critical uh, convergence. That is related with the critical surface mass density and other parameters that, is, that are values that were, whose values are obtained directly from directed directly from observations. Okay. So these are our results. Uh, we have all the profiles, we have all the surface mass densities, and we have obtained the deflection angles. All these uh, equations have been analytically obtained, and uh, we must recall that. The PA model and the FU, the NFW model are classic. So these equations are in the literature, whatever you search, but the other results are new. And these results uh, we're analyzing in data right now because we want to understand how is related the model with the images. So uh, these plots shows for the models that we have found out, the surface mass density behavior and the deflection angle behavior, because we want to understand what does it mean to see something in the, in the sky related with the behavior of this deflection angle. That is, we now to, well, we want to compute the images. But the first pro the problem originally is how to describe the image information using the, using the lens map. We have the tools, and the tools are that we already have been working with this topic for the Schwarzschild lens. And our goal is to simplify the data processing in each case. So what is the method? Uh, you can take a usual lens, an ordinary lens, model how is set the point source, your optical axis, uh, your lens, and analyze the Ronchi rulings and the Ronchi run. What is that? The Ronchi rulings is a, are test fringes that are mapped by the lens into the Ronchi run. What you see in the Ronchi run is information encoded by the lens. So we built a vector field, this X vector field that encodes information of, uh, of that lens. If we use this other vector field that is a refracted, refracted library and we obtain the Ronchi theorems. 
This is for a usual lens, a simple lens, uh, whatever you can take as a lens. But why can we apply this method in, a, in gravitational lensing? Well, the method is reliable because we already have worked with obtaining this kind of Ronchigrams, Rapito Ronchigrams, so-called that way, uh, using the metric, the Schwarzschild metric, uh, integrating the new geodesics and obtaining the Ronchigrams for a gravitational lens. This is our, these are the Ronchigrams for a Schwarzschild lens, obtained analytic, analytically, All right? Here is a reference. We have worked with that. We have shown that in an exact manner from the point of view of the metric tensor, we can obtain that Ronchi graph, that uh, image information for that problem. Okay, so if the method is reliable, how, we, how can we know that? Well, the upper plots are the graphics from this method applied to the Schwarzschild lens, uh, considering this lens as a thin lens. The, <clears throat> the lower plots are the exact, exact plots for a Ronchi ram using the metric tensor. You can see that, the, that both approaches have similar behaviors and this will be useful for our calculations. The X vector field that is uh, in the upper equation encodes the information of the lens, the gravitational lens. And now we can analyze the, the deflection angle well, uh, as you want to analyze that. Uh, we try to study how is the behavior of that uh, deflection angle. So, uh, sorry, so far, have, uh, we three have... Sorry? Uh, you have three minutes before questions. Okay, yeah. uh, I will do make this fast. So the technical difficulties of this stage is that the equations are highly nonlinear. For Schwarzschild, it was easy. But for this, the profile that we are studying, we need to uh, analyze how to find the roots of the equations because those roots means the number of images. So we are working with this equation, the second of this equation, because uh, for strong lensing, this equation uh, gives us uh, the position. We can study for several planes, observation planes, and we can find how many images the, uh, each profile could generate. Uh, so we are, uh, here we repeat the, the same. The deflection angles are nonlinear, so to find the images, uh, we need the roots for that equation. And we we want to recall something that is important. This equation, the second of the left equations, uh, for a specific for a specific values of the of the observation plane, reproduces the lens equation, the lens mapping. That is, uh, basing our calculations in something analog to a lens, an ordinary lens, we obtain the lens equation for gravitational lens, and we can study directly that problem. So we can find how many images, and eventually we want to draw the images formed by these profiles. So the conclusions are that we have found analytical expressions for the basic equations in this image information process. These equations allow us to analyze the behavior of the imaging generation. The next stage is to understand how it related this process with the gravitational process. If we achieve our goal, it will be easier and direct to compare the images with real data to interpret the physics behind of such images. And this approach could eventually be very useful to make faster calculations for observation of data. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Omar, for the presentation. And, uh, okay, this, is there any question? We have a, a couple of minutes for question. So, I have a comment in the meantime. So, 
if I understood correctly, which kind of lensing are you studying uh, from this approach? Is it strong lensing or also weak lensing? Well, it's strong lensing, <clears throat> but we want to find out if the, the method is uh, useful even for weak lensing. That is, because, when you yeah. model, I'm sorry, no, when you model this. Yes. No, please, please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. When you have the problem of the lensing, in ordinary lensing, you have the source, the lens, and the images. Okay? So our method has been proved for um, gravitational lensing, Schwarzschild, but we believe that uh, for strong lensing, for these deflection angles could be very useful, but can be generalized to weak lensing for other positions of the source, uh, but with analytical, with analytical equations. Okay. That is one of the goals. Okay. But my comment is because uh, for sure, shield uh, in the surrounding of a compact object, with, uh, if it's, uh, you are outside that spherical object and you have sure shield, okay, it, it, at some point uh, it should be a strong lensing. But for the diluted part of the halos of galaxies, of, uh, for example, for profiles you have shown, uh, as, soon as, as soon as you go to, to the halo part, you certainly will have weak lens. Because, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so just to say that the, 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 the expectation you, you show from Schwarzschild, uh, you should not expect uh, these deflection angles and, and, and I think the magnification should change a lot uh, because yeah, yes in fact we are talking about that because uh, our original goal was to study um, for um, Lebanski the Minsky metric we want to find what are the domain wh where the new geodesics behave like strong lensing and after weak lensing but this approach uh, don't use the metric this approach, what it uses is the uh, thin lens approximation. And of course, uh, there are regions where this approach will not be useful, but we want to find out where, because some regions we expect that reproduce the images that we can compare with real data yes. and to see where this, this broke, right? Good. Yeah. Then if you want, I can share you a paper we have done a couple of years ago showing a trans con in a continuous way transition from strong lensing to weak lensing out of uh, a distribution of dark matter. Uh, of course, in a particular case where dark matter get concentrated toward the center, <clears throat> but we have analyzed the lensing properties, also the flexion angle, magnification, etc., and showing mm -hmm. that is a continuous transition between weak and strong uh, numerically, not analytically, because uh, and the metric is not sure, it's uh, more general because uh, you have pressure from this dark matter at the center. But anyway, if you want, uh, then I can show to you this work. Uh, yes, 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 thank you. Because yes. uh, certainly in the in the halos, you will have a weak lens. Yes. So, yes, thank you. Good. Uh, is there uh, any other question or comment? Okay. Then we thank Somar again uh, for the talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then we move to coffee break. We are just in time for coffee break. Uh, so let me see. Yes, let's come back in 10 minutes, please, at uh, uh, 5.55. And we'll see you in 10 minutes. Can you see now? Yes. Good. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Barry. Well, I present Barry Ginat. Uh,
he will talk about the, this hard problem of the aberration problem in cosmology, uh, multiple scales approach. And can you say your institution, Barry? Yes, I'm from the Technion in Israel. I'm Good. a PhD student. Okay, uh, sorry, I forgot to write it here on the slide. No, it's okay. Uh, well, you can start. Uh, okay, so thank you for, for uh, uh, the opportunity to talk at this conference. Um, and as I said, I'm a PhD student in, uh, in Haifa in Israel, and I'm uh, going to uh, discuss the averaging problem in cosmology. So in, in my talk, I'll first start by uh, describing the problem and then uh, very rapidly uh, review the multiple scales technique in, in applied mathematics. Then I'll try to apply that uh, to Einstein's equations. I'll discuss some uh, important equations that come out uh, of this analysis that are called consistency conditions, and then I'll summarize. So let me start. All right. So on large scales, um, sorry, let me just say that this talk is a bit different from uh, the other, uh, the subjects of the other talks in this session, but I think it's going to be interesting nonetheless. I hope at least. So, uh, yeah. So. The universe is sure it will. Sure it will. <laughs> on on large scales, um, as you know, as we all studied in undergraduate uh, physics, uh, it's described by an FLRW metric on these scales, uh, which is uh, the uh, only homogeneous and isotropic solution to Einstein's equations. And here I've written Einstein's equations. Um, in this notation so that you remember because I'm going to use that later. So GAB is the Einstein tensor. So it's uh, the Riemann, sorry, the Ricci tensor minus half uh, G times the trace. All right. Um, so in large case, that's what we get. That also fits observations very well, um, extremely well. Even some people say too well. Um, but on small scales, it's very inhomogeneous. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you go inside a galaxy, for example, or even in a galaxy cluster, there are very large density fluctuations. So the change in density relative to the background uh, density is very big. Um, so orders of magnitude. And of course, the smaller uh, the, smaller the scale, uh, the more inhomogeneous the universe becomes. So uh, this poses a problem because averaging and Einstein's equations do not commute. So if you want to average on over those small scale inhomogeneities uh, to get this averaged energy momentum tensor, um, then you have to average the left-hand side of Einstein's equations as well. So you get this thing. Okay, so you average the Einstein tensor and the, and the metric. But then, because it's nonlinear, this is not equal Einstein tensor evaluated at the average metric. But so when we solve Einstein's equation, to get FLRW, what we solve is the Einstein tensor evaluated at the average metric plus thing, the, this cosmological constant term equals the average density uh, and energy momentum tensor. But that's not Einstein's equation, right? It's 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 not uh, it's not um, the physical equation one should use. One should use uh, the the second one, which is the correct averaging uh, of Einstein's field equations. So maybe possibly there's something wrong in our way of in, in the usual way that uh, FLRW solutions are, are derived. Um, and this is and, and and the fact that averaging does not commute with uh, the Einstein equations. It's called the averaging problem. It's also called the back reaction problem um, because small scales can react back on large scales. Um, and this is a problem because as I've mentioned, FLRW is, very, is a very good description of reality. Um, right, so, so this is the problem. And, and there's another facet to this problem uh, and it's the background plus perturbation split. So, so in cosmological perturbation theory, um, the way one, one goes about uh, um, solving the uh, field equations there is to take the metric and, and 
write it as sum of the FLRW metric plus some perturbation, and then expand on the scale and it's also dependent uh, on gauge. And so the question arises uh, whether this split is at all justified given that, uh, given this averaging problem that I've described previously. Sorry. Um, so, uh, well, I'm not the first person to study it. Um, it has been known for quite some time and, and several uh, ideas have already been uh, suggested um, and they involve, for example, uh, averaging techniques in curved space time. Um, so, so because it's not, not trivial, um, this averaging procedure is not trivial, uh, there can be uh, various ways of defining it and, and then studying uh, the effect of, uh, of this uh, nonlinearity on, on the averaging. Or one could use uh, special perturbative techniques like uh, Greenwald did in 10 years ago. Um, but at least to my understanding, all those techniques uh, relies, relied on, on the assumption of the existence of a background space-time, uh, so the split or a similar split. Um, and I'm going to explain a way to derive the existence of a background under certain uh, conditions. Right. So this way involves the multiple scale uh, uh, expansion. So this is a, an expansion um, from perturbation theory or from singular perturbation theory. Uh, it's very useful in, in many branches of mathematics, uh, for example, in diffusion, uh, homogenization, um, the Chapman and Skog expansion, and, and very many other things. And I'll give you an example for, uh, for a Poisson equation, and then uh, we'll work our way to, towards Einstein's equation. So we take a Poisson equation, for example, this equation. Um, well, this function f depends on position in, in, in two ways. One, on a very, very small scale, right? So this is the, the, the right-hand side, and, and also on position just normally, right? Where epsilon is some small parameter. And the method of multiple scales says that you should set big X equals to small X over epsilon. So big X is the small scale, and little X is the large scale. And then you should uh, treat big X and little X as uh, independent variables. So the derivatives become, so the derivative D by DX becomes D by DX plus one of epsilon D by D big X. And then you insert this uh, change of the derivative into the equation and you, you exchange X over epsilon with big X and you expand. Right, so, so what you get is this uh, equation that I've written at the bottom of this slide. And then you expand, so you take this equation, uh, treating little x and big x independently and expand, and you expand in, in powers of epsilon. Uh, and notice that I've expanded u in powers of epsilon as an asymptotic series as well, right? Because in general, u is going to depend on epsilon. So I can expand it. Okay, um, so yeah, so you take this expansion, you solve order by order, and and then um, this is not the end because because we've increased the number of degrees of freedom from just little x to big x and little x, and and we have to we have to require that um, the asymptotic expansion stay consistent so that the nth term is much bigger than the nth, n plus one or n plus first term. Um, and this, this is done um, by taking, well, by setting certain integration constant to zero. Um, and this is fine because these are going to become additional equations that, that fix the additional degrees of freedom that we've uh, uh, defined. And, and then in the end, we set that we, we we set big X equals to little x over epsilon graph. So, so this is the multiple scales technique. And, 
now I'll try to apply that to Einstein's equation. So I'm working in harmonic cage um, and that renders the equation hyperbolic. And then, and then we take X as cosmological scales and big X as, as small scales, so for example, galactic scales. So I've tried to make this sketch. Every point you see here is a galaxy and then you zoom in into the galaxy and, and then you can see that, that big X describes motion inside the galaxy and little X describes motion, describes motion of the galaxy. Okay, then we do the same thing. We expand the derivatives, uh, we split the derivatives, then expand in powers of epsilon. And we require consistency. And I'll show you how, how this is done. So uh, you take the trace reversed Einstein equation, and then uh, you, you do this uh, expansion. In harmonic coordinates, there's an explicit expression for the Ricci tensor, so that's good. Um, so first, let me tell you what we found, what we find. Um, so what we find is that uh, the space-time part of big X, so remember I've added um, four, four more coordinates, so that there are four coordinates of the small X and four more uh, for, the, for big X. Um, so it's eight-dimensional, the, the manifold is eight-dimensional now. Um, and, and what we found, what, what we find is that the big X space-time is flat, so the big X. For fixed small x, the part of space-time that pertains to big X is flat. And that means uh, two things. So that means that averaging on this part of space-time is um, not ambiguous because it's flat space-time. And we know how to uh, do Fourier analysis, averaging and all that on this, on flat space-times. And then uh, we get an averaged Einstein equation um, well, on the left-hand side, we have the normal, the normal uh, Einstein equations. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, the averaged trace invert, inverted uh, energy momentum tensor plus a correction. And the correction uh, will turn out to correspond to, uh, to be equal to um, the energy momentum tensor of Newtonian gravitational potential energy. In uh, under a certain condition, which I'll, I'll describe in the next slide. Um, so the average equation is consistent with the previously known equation. Um, but what we can do is that we can show that uh, G0, so the first order term in the expansion of G in powers of epsilon, is actually a background. Uh, so we can prove that. And the way to do that is to write down uh, the first, the leading order equation. So it's order epsilon to the minus two, that's what comes out. Um, and you see that um, if there are only Newtonian sources, so slow, slow moving and non-relativistic, so no black holes and no neutron stars at, at present, um, and everything moves um, much slower than the speed of light, uh, which is a great for cosmology. Uh, so if so, then this equation can be solved um, can be solved uniquely by a function g naught, which is independent of the small scale, right? Because there are derivatives, and this is a wave equation. This is essentially a wave equation, and the right hand side is zero because it's only Newtonian uh, sources. Um, okay, so we've we've derived that the fact that g zero is only a function of the large scale, and that uh, and that proves that it is a background, uh, a background space time. And then higher order terms, G1, et cetera, satisfy um, other wave equations. So for G1, this is the wave equation that you get. Um, and it's very similar to the uh, wave equation for gravitational waves, or if it's time independent, then to the Poisson equation. Um, uh, five for, minutes, uh, Barry. Thank you, yes, okay. okay. I'm, Okay, so it's very similar to the Poisson equation or to the um, wave equation, depending on whether it's time dependent or not. Um, and the space time that G1 uh, lives in is space time, uh, is the X, big X space time, uh, where, where G0 is now a constant in big X. So being a constant in big X means that it's uh, actually flat space time. 
So G1 is actually uh, waves over flat space time, and we can solve that uh, quite easily. And then we proceed to second order. And the second order equation is where, is where all the interesting things happen. Um, because the equation for the second order, G2, um, as a function of big X, it contains both uh, energy momentum uh, of, of, of matter, but also G1 uh, of big X as a source, um, because uh, the Einstein equations are nonlinear. And the problem is that G1 being waves can resonate with the wave equation operator. Um, and that can cause G2 to become very, very big because of resonances. And the way to get rid of those resonances is to impose a consistency condition. Um, that, that is to impose that any term, term in G1 uh, that, that is resonant be, or, or the sum be set to zero. And that's fine because uh, this equation contains a homogeneous solution, so a solution uh, that uh, turns the left-hand side to zero. And this is not constrained by any initial data, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it has to be fixed by, by something. And this something is precisely the consistency condition, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, and, and this consistency condition removes the resonances and ensures that the asymptotic expansion remains valid. And you can do that at higher orders as well. So this is the consistency condition. It looks very unpleasant, but uh, it can be solved. Um, so to remove the resonances at each order uh, explicitly. Um, and indeed, if sources are Newtonian, then this can be done consistently for higher orders as well, and also uh, proves that uh, G0 is a background uh, metric. All right, so the outcome, let me summarize. Um, is that we've managed to uh, show that there's a well-defined background that doesn't depend on the small scale, and it's also, oh, oh, sorry, only large scale dependent. Um, and I've shown you how to derive, well, I haven't shown it uh, completely, but uh, it is possible to use this uh, technique to derive an averaged Einstein equation, um, where the correction term turns out to be uh, the energy momentum tensor of Newtonian gravitational potential energy. Um, and the conditions under which this can be done are, are exactly the conditions under which the consistency equations can be solved. And uh, this turns out uh, to be possible um, at least for uh, Newtonian uh, sources. Uh, in the future, uh, future, so some future directions um, include uh, going from an asymptotic expansion to some sort of uh, convergence. So um, probably uh, because it's a multiple scale expansion, it's going to be two scale convergence uh, in the language of uh, PDEs. And also um, very importantly to be able to include at least isolated first uh, relativistic sources such as black holes. Um, and this can probably be done uh, using the Birkhoff theorem uh, in some way or another. Um, well, that's it. Um, for more information, uh, please have a look at my paper uh, or send me an email or ask me any question. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Barry, for this interesting talk on this very hard problem. And uh, well, uh, is there any question? Raise hand. Not yet. Okay. In the meantime, I, I have a comment. Um, so uh, let's suppose you have a, okay, uh, let me think. So le, suppose you want to apply your approach uh, to uh, recover the, the Friedman Robertson Walker metric. Um, I mean, can you show or uh, have a prescription on how the this back reaction of, of small scales to large scales will affect the the, the metric. Um, yes. So uh, this that is something, specific case. Yeah. So this is something I've glossed over a bit. Um, so essentially, you you use this equation, um, yeah. the average Einstein equation. Then you have. Okay, then here everything depends only on large scales because I've averaged out the small scales. Um, 
and and if p was if this p a b tensor was zero yeah then you would get exactly f l w um, ah ah you get exactly because is is the, is the solution you shown at the beginning this uh, yeah this yeah but b but this b a b tensor is not zero but it's small so you have to do an additional expansion both in in the magnitude of this uh, back reaction tensor um, and then you would get that if you expand at the magnitude of this tensor, then the leading order term would be FLRW. So you have you have two uh, you have two expansion parameter. One is the small scale epsilon, and then a, a posteriori, um, once you've shown that this um, back reaction term is small, then you yes. expand also in the size of this back reaction term. Yeah. So so one. Let, correct me, please, if I'm wrong. But what we would like to do then out of this approach is to put some energy source or matter energy energy source, even non-relativistic, as you said, and try to see the, the leading order correction of the Freeman Robertson Walker equation, and yes. then to uh, test it somehow. Uh, at least it should be possible transitioning between scales where you know that uh, there is the breakdown from large scale to small scales and you should try to use some observations in principle yes i mean the yes, one would I like think, to make this phenomenology yeah so you would you would put uh, for example for the small scale part you would put some uh, halo profile that you like and then yeah. plug it into the expression for this back reaction tensor PAB, which I haven't shown you, but uh, it, essentially it means calculate its uh, Newtonian gravitational potential energy and plug it into the equations and then uh, solve, right? Solve for the correction to the FLRW. Yes. Uh, that's what it would be very, so you, you, have you tried these? Have you tried already? Um, so I haven't, I haven't solved uh, I haven't uh, tried that yet, but ah. uh, it would be very interesting to think about that. Okay, and then you also, I, I guess, you also have to think if the uh, due to this expansion, the 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 so large scaling, for example, between a halo and and your large scale structure is applicable up to the expansion of epsilon you have made i mean i, I know if you, if you follow um meaning maybe there may be the case that the the smaller scale is too small uh, oh i see respect to I see the, what you mean yeah yeah um but, yeah so but i guess it's just a matter it's just a matter of checking uh, up to which uh, large scale down to exactly. which so, down to which large scale you have to to move up in order for your approach to work probably clusters of yeah, galaxies so you, maybe you have right. you have to have yeah exactly so um indeed if epsilon were equal to one for example then this approach doesn't make sense and so does and so does uh and so only really if you have like sort of scale splitting uh then you can use that but i think fortunately in our universe you, you can see that there's some splitting um okay oh at least at least you can you can do a, you can you can take i don't know so i've taken uh for concreteness i've taken uh, uh i think 100 megaparsec as this uh homogeneous scale um and then you can do it by hand you can split the scale you can split the scale dependence by hand anything below that is going to count as small scale anything about above that uh is going to count as large scale but you can take a different value mm. okay nice yes so well i hope i hope i don't know if there is any question so my comment is that i hope to see oh yes rodrigo please I was just wondering if you wanted to, I mean, would it make sense at all to try and like have a, a multi hierarchy going down to the, oh. to the sources of where, where the mass is like, uh, um, because even galaxies are, are not homogeneous. I mean, they're, they're, they're not point sources either, right? <laughs> yes. So you, yes. Could, you um, could take it down in, in scale. So yes, uh, ideally there should be a lot of epsilons and then each one of them will come with its own uh, 
at least um, up to some point with its own uh, big X. Um, but uh, then, I, I, and even more ideally, it should be done in some continuous uh, RG-like <laughs> approach. Um, um, but I am not there yet, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. Ideally, that's what should happen. Okay, and another, I have another comment that, uh, I don't know, maybe you are that are working this theory, maybe interesting is that I have seen years before uh, approaches from these expert people on cosmology, Saldarriaga and colleagues uh, that try to claim mm -hmm. some strong constraints out of their analysis on these averaging problems, saying that up to, oh, I now I don't remember the text, but uh, they, they gave some prescription to saying that uh, that uh, try to quantify the deviations. How bad is the is the is the is the standard average uh, effective problem with with what we expect? And I don't know. At least uh, you could test your your maybe your procedure uh, respect to the conclusions they yeah. they made from their approach. Maybe to to see if you get the so, same conclusions. So I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar with, um, with that, but I think there is this uh, cosmological, cosmological effective field theory of large space. Exactly, this is what oh, I mean. Oh, okay, so yeah, so, so this very is hard, sort of- Very hard, very hard math uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, um, sorry, um, this theory, um, it's sort of, uh, I think, well, I'm, maybe I'm saying something uh, not completely correct. Um, I think as far as I understand, uh, this procedure does not disagree with uh, effective theory of, of large scale structure. Um, mm. and, and since both, both of them would eventually give a perturbation, a way to compute perturbations to, um, to FLRW, um, but I think what I can show is that indeed there's, I mean, you don't have to assume that there's a background, you can just show it. Okay, thank you, Barry, and let's move to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, which is Jordi, if you uh, want to start to share your slides. <laughs> Uh, did, do you see my slides? Yes, you can. We can see. Uh, let's see if you if it is already on full screen. Maybe it's my screen. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so now uh, we will speak Jordi Solis Lopez uh, from Simbestab, and he will talk about scalar filter matter. You can start. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, every, but every, everyone. Um, as Dr. Arguella said, um, my name is Jordi Solis Lopez. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Simpestad, Mexico. Uh, the name of my talk is Scalar Field Like Mother as an alternative explanation of, for the anisotropic distribution of satellite galaxies. Um, this talk is based on this article that I show you here. Uh, um, this work is in collaboration with uh, the doctor I, doctors I lead here. Um, well, uh, the introduction. Uh, um, first of all, uh, the scalar field dark matter model is also known as Fusic dark matter, back dark matter, and wave dark matter, ultra light dark matter, and uh, um, is, um, uh, among others. Um, uh, this model assumes that the dark matter in the universe uh, is comprised of ultra light spinless boson particles. 
Uh, so the equation of motion is the klein gordon equation. Uh, mu is the mass of the scalar field, um, phi is the scalar field. Um, uh, the, um, by solving the einstein clay gordon system, uh, this model recovers the success of at large scales uh, of the lambda called dark matter uh, model. Um, it only differs at small scales. Uh, for example, uh, there is a cutoff in the mass power spectrum at small scales. Uh, as long as the boson mass is ultralight, uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 24 electron volts. Uh, other example is the, that the density profiles are constant in the galactic center uh, with a logarithmic slope of minus 27. Mm. Um, uh, the einstein klein gordon system in the weak field and non-relativistic limits become the, becomes the Schrodinger-Poisson system. Uh, here, C is the order parameter and V is the gravitational potential. Uh, mu is the particle mass uh, and the square of the other parameter is the dark matter density. Uh, this is the source of the gravitational potential. Uh, at galactic scales, uh, the dark matter is ruled by the schrodinger poisson system. Uh, now I'm going to give you a small introduction to the planes of satellite galaxies problem. Uh, uh, since the 70s, uh, it has been real, realized that the Milky Way satellites uh, appear to be in a, an isotropic dislike structure. Uh, here in the left figure, uh, I show you an edge on view of the plane fitted by the position of the 11 classical satellites uh, in galactocentric coordinates. Uh, the blue line is the fitted plane. Uh, the green and orange lines uh, represent the root mean square distance of the dwarf satellites from the fitted plane. Uh, in the central figure, uh, uh, I show you the, the same fit, but now uh, plotting the position of the classical satellites and the ultra faint satellites. Uh, um, in the right uh, figure, uh, uh, I also plot the new satellite candidates and global system, globular clusters. Um, we can see that all objects follow the same planar structure. Uh, the angular pulse, uh, the direction of the angular momentum. Uh, of the classical satellites also uh, exhibit an anisotropic distribution. Uh, all but three points almost the same direction. Uh, that is almost the same direction of the normal of the fitted plane. Uh, uh, this indicates that the satellites are co-orbiting uh, in the planar structure. Uh, mm, the angular momentum of sculpture uh, 
points in the opposite direction that the rest of the satellite. Uh, this, uh, this indicates that it's counter orbiting in the plane. Uh, in colder matter simulations, a uh, situation like this only happen in less than 0.1% of the systems. Mm. Uh, in the Andromeda system, uh, similar things happen. Uh, here I plot the projections in the X seed and J seed, Y seed planes uh, of the position of the satellites. Um, uh, in this system, um, 13 of the 27 satellites are in a plane uh, that is called the Great Plane of Andromeda. Uh, the motion uh, of these satellite galaxies around Andromeda shows to be anisotropic too. Uh, the satellite seems to co-rotate uh, like the satellites in the Milky Way. Uh, uh, besides the BPOS in the Milky Way and the Great Plain of Andromeda, uh, there are two more planes in non-satellite galaxies uh, in the local group. Uh, one plane with nine and the other one with five dwarf galaxies. Uh, among the 50 dwarf galaxies in the local group, 43 are contained in four different planes. Uh, this is inconsistent with the isotropy uh, predicted by simulations or based on cold dark matter model. Uh, there are um, possible explanations within the cold dark matter frame. Uh, uh, the first one is that uh, outside the BPOS, there are extra satellites that are still too faint to be detected. Uh, Another is uh, the, interaction, the interactions between gas and radiation might affect the uh, isotropy of the final distribution of satellites. Um, uh, or simply the Milky Way and Andromeda are atypical galaxies. Uh, However, there is a third system in which this anisotropy, anisotropies also occurs. Uh, this is the SEN-8 system uh, that consists on, of an elliptical galaxy called Centaurus A and uh, a set of 31 satellites. Um, in this figure, uh, I show you projections of the position of the satellite in galactocentric coordinates. Um, uh, sorry, uh, you have five minutes, Jordi. Yes, in this system, two planes can be fed. Uh, the satellites in red and blue are the two planes. And in gray, the ones that don't belong to either. Uh, uh, in this system, uh, uh, later it was real, realized that only they were only one plane, and that fourteen or 
the of 16 satellites uh, could be co-rotating. Uh, the probability of finding such a misotropic distribution in Kodak mile simulations is less than 0.5%. Now, noticing that there are three galaxies in the in the local volume uh, shows with the same problem shows that uh, uh, we need a possible alternative explanation uh, based on different dark matter models. Um, uh, as I told you in the, in the introduction, we're going to model the dark matter as a scalar field. Uh, um, to try to explain this problem, there are going to be four assumptions. Uh, the first one is that the gravitational potential of the host galaxy is going to be dominated by the uh, scalar field dark matter halo. The second one is that the satellites are assumed to behave as test particles orbiting around the halo. Uh, the third one is the, that the low energy and weak field regimes holds, uh, which is valid in galactic scale regime. And the final one is that uh, the halo is in a multi-state equilibrium configuration. Uh, right. The question of model of the model are then the Schroeder Poisson system for multiple states. Uh, we are going to consider stash, uh, two stationary states. And uh, in equation four, uh, the dark matter density is the sum of the different contributions of each state. Uh, in equation five, I show you the expression of the total mass of the halo, uh, which is going to be the sum of the mass of each of the different states in the configuration. Uh, the Schrodinger Poisson system has the scaling property shown in relation seven uh, that gives, you, gives us uh, two free parameters for our model. Uh, this is the particle mass and the scaling parameter. Uh, to find axisymmetric solutions, we follow the general framework of Guzman and Ureña Lopez. Uh, we construct, construct uh, stationary solutions with the spherical ground state and the first dipolar contribution. Uh, we choose, we choose this contribution for three reasons, uh, because it is the simple, simplest non-spherically symmetric uh, multi-state configuration. Uh, the resulting two blobs associated with the polar mode are expected to pull the test particles uh, toward the poles, and that the, there is a possible mechanism, mechanism for the formation of such structures. Mm, uh, in the case of two states, there is a extra parameter in addition to the mass and the scaling parameter uh, is the mass ratio between states. Uh, however, we, we, we are only going to analyze two specific values of the mass ratio. Uh, one where the spherical monopole term dominates over the dipole, and and the other one where the dipole dominates over the ground state. Uh, in the figures, I show you the projections of the dark matter density in the exit plane for both uh, configurations. So if a halo is in a multi-state configuration, there will be local minimums of the gravitational potential that will influence the trajectories of the particles and the structures within the halo. Uh, then the particles traveling around the halo will distribute in a non-isotropic manner. 
and that could explain the observation of the BPOS. Uh, we integrate the trajectories of 10 to the 5 particles, test particles, with emission position um, uh, that are random, random uh, chosen from a distribution of, over the radial interval, radius interval 0 to 4 in a dimensional units. Uh, the initial velocities are random in direction with velocity magnitude randomly chosen from a, unif a uniform distribution over the interval zero to uh, a fraction of the scale velocity. Uh, in the figure, I plot the initial distribution of the test particles. Uh, uh, given the randomness of the initial conditions, the, re the regions where the particles accumulate the most are also the, the region where a single particle has a bigger likelihood to reside. Uh, after evolving sufficiently long time, uh, test particles distribute anisotropically and concentrate mainly around the equatorial plane, plane of the configuration and along the seat ex axis. Um, in the left figure, uh, I show you the case of the monopole dominated configuration and in the right figure, the dipole dominated. Uh, the, here I show you the orbital poles of the test particles that are around the range of 30 to 300 kiloparsecs from the origin. Uh, um, in the left for the monopole dominated configuration and in the right for the dipole dominated configuration. The orbital poles accumulate around the polar angle half of P with the pass of time, uh, their distribution tend to be stationary uh, after a fifth of the final evolution time. Uh, uh, we did uh, other consistency checks in the model. Uh, we fit the rotation curve of the Milky Way. We checked if the stellar disks inside the this symmetric halo could be destroyed and if the halo was non lived uh, you can check it out in the in this in the original paper um, and the conclusions are this uh, multi state solutions of the growth Poisson or Schrodinger Poisson system induce randomly initially set test particles to distribute anisotropical with higher concentration at the poles in the asymptotic time. Uh, a single particle interpreted as a satellite hosted in a galaxy with a multi-state uh, halo uh, farther than 30 kiloparsecs from the galaxy origin will be, will be more likely to orbit in, with a polar angle near half of P on flat trajectories uh, the viability, viability of the multi-state halo as long-living self gravitation structure, uh, the consistency of the multi-state solution with rotation curves and the stability of the X distribution uh, were analyzed. Um, our results are valid in the long term. Uh, which means that eventually the polar angles of satellite satellites in Andromeda should approach half of P as time evolves. Uh, the motion of the test particles traveling up on top of this multi-state configuration is different from the results obtained in a non-spherical cordal mare halo. It, um, 
The final one is that the ultra liposomic dark matter has potential to explain the DPOS observation in the Milky Way and the observations in Andromeda and Centaurus A. Uh, this is, okay. these are the reference and that will be all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Uh, I think you are, we are a bit out of time. Uh, so I will ask uh, if you don't mind to skip the question to the discussion session so we can, uh, I, so I will ask the two last speaker to show uh, Aurelian. Yes, I'm here. Hello, Aurelian. Hello. Good. So if you want to start to share your slides, please. Sure. Okay, here we are. It works? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Good, so I will present Aurelien Barrow from um, Laboratory of Physics, Subatomic and Cosmology, CNRS. And well, uh, yes, so go ahead, please. And you have uh, 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So I will probably not use all my time, which is good news for the last talk of the day. And I'm going to say some very basic and, and simple uh, things. Uh, I also apologize for having too much text on my slide, but uh, I prefer this is allows the, 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 the talk to be somehow self-contained. So my point is about uh, quite simple, and I would qualify it at not too exotic hypothesis about dark matter as Planck relics. So uh, first, let's begin with transplantian scattering. Uh, those days, there are a lot of studies that are revived uh, around primordial black holes, but most of studies about uh, primordial black holes uh, do rely on production mechanisms that uh, involve the collapse of an abundance region for one reason or another. Uh, this scenario is of course very tantalizing, but we know that the problem is that the density contrast which is required to form a PDH is uh, close to one. It is, it is smaller than one, but it is of order one. So of course, taking into account the normalization of the power spectrum as seen in the CMB and extrapolating to very small scale, we don't expect any primordial black hole at all. So there are many scenarios that are being considered to overproduce primordial black holes and to try to have an interesting phenomenology. But in my opinion, most of them, if not all of them, do rely on some quite exotic hypothesis. So what we shall focus on now is something which look exotic, but which probably is not. That is the transplantian uh, scattering process. The fact is that when the impact parameter between two um, quanta is uh, smaller than the associated Schwarzschild radius, associated with a given energy, then if the scattering is transplantian, the probability to form a black hole is of order one. This is a process which is very well uh, understood, which is in a regime where semi-classical considerations of general relativity do apply, and we expect this uh, pre prediction to be very reliable. This is not exotic physics. It does not require any extra dimension any new uh, any any complicated model this is somehow standard general relativity the elastic cross section is suppressed by a Boltzmann factor and this is why you will not you are screened to some extent to standard uh, QCD sketch okay so what to do with this well the cross section is of order pi r squared this is of the order of the usual um, geometry called cross-section with a factor f, which is of order unity. You can change it a little, but it will not change the order of magnitudes of what I'm going to say now. So most um, uh, phenomenological studies about those uh, black holes formed by transplantian scattering were set by um, lowering the Planck scale, for example, with the extra dimensions, adding the Planck scale in the TV range, and therefore opening the gate to a very wide and exciting phenomenology. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to leave the Planck scale at the usual Planck scale, 10 to the 19 GeV, and to work without any extra dimensions. The second input is about stable relics. Well, we know that the um, Hawking evaporation process is something very reliable. This is, uh, uh, even though it has not yet been uh, experimentally probed, this is very standard physics of quantum field theory 
in curved space time, the Hawking temperature is basically proportional to one over the mass. So it is an explosive process. The black hole radiates energy, but by radiating energy, it is getting hotter and hotter, and therefore the temperature increases. It's very straightforward to compute the mass loss rate, which is proportional to m to the minus two. So it is really a bomb because the mass decreases, and as the mass decreases, the speed of decrease does increase. The problem of this view is that it leads to a complete disappearance of the black hole and therefore to the appearance of a naked singularity. So obviously the status of the endpoint is unclear because when you reach the Planck mass, the semi-classical treatment as used by Hawking uh, breaks down. And we don't know for sure what happens during the last stages, but most probably, the divergence of the temperature, which appears in the usual formula when n goes to zero, is non-physical. And there are quite a lot of arguments that I believe to be convincing, pushing in favor of the existence of stable relics around the Planck mass. There are arguments from quantum gravity, from string gravity, from modified gravity. Of course, you could argue that all those um, approaches are exotic new physics, and this is correct. But I also like very much the arguments from uh, Giddings, which show that locality, causality, and energy conservation uh, seen from the viewpoint of information paradox do suggest that the time scale for the final decay of the form, the black hole, is always much larger than the edge of the universe. So I would say that at this stage, there are many different arguments coming either from very deep fundamental theories or from kind of thought experiments converging towards the existence that once a black hole reach the Planck scale after its evaporation, something stops and we are left with a kind of relic. So now you see where I want to come. Could these relics uh, explain dark matter? This idea is not new. Uh, as far as uh, I can say, it was uh, initially uh, proposed by Jen McGibbon, I think in a Nature article, but at the time it was associated with the production of primordial black holes once again through the collapse of other dense regions. And it completely changed the game when you focus on the hypothesis that I am um, pushing right now. So let's consider usual physics, so three plus, three plus, three plus one dimensional space time. And let's just take into account a tail of transplankian particles. So, this is, I would say, the uh, only, uh, in my view, uh, exotic part of the model. You need the energy scale of inflation to be quite high and to be quite higher than usually expected. I'm going to focus on this, uh, to come back on this later. But what you can already understand immediately is that you don't need a lot of relics to be formed at the rate in time, just because the relics are diluted as non-relativistic matter, so therefore as the scale factor to the minus three, whereas the surrounding radiation, that is all the other content of the universe, scales as relativistic uh, species, and therefore as a to the minus four. And just due to this uh, different you can compute that you need only a fraction of the energy of the universe of the order of 10 to the minus 24 at the rate in time to account for all dark matter at the equilibrium time. So the point is that if you form your non-relativistic black hole relics at the rate heating, you need only a very small fraction of them to completely account for the dark matter that we could be seeing just right now. However, it's fair to, uh, to, under, to, to, to underline that the, we have an exponential suppression, of course, of the amount of particles uh, uh, above the equilibrium temperature for any uh, thermal distribution. And therefore, even if we need only a small fraction of relics, we need a high energy at rating. Otherwise, we have nearly nothing in the transplantian tail. So let's now put um, numbers on all that. Uh, is it realistic to assume a rating scale which is, say, not too far from the Planck scale, maybe two orders of magnitude below the Planck scale? 
This is in contradiction with what is usually assumed in cosmology. Usually in, in standard models of cosmology, we assume the energy scale of inflation to be around the gut scale or something like that, because if it is higher, then it conflicts with the upper limit we have on the tensor to scalar ratio. So I would say that there are several ways to evade this argument. The first one consists in noticing that the upper limit we have um, uh, holds firmly only for some class of uh, inflationary models. And for example, when you go to K-inflation, to multi-field inflation, etc., the limits are not the same and they can be quite severely relaxed. The second point I would like to make is more provocative. So this is the following. We all know that temperature and isotropies that we observe in the CMB do originate from Phoenix, physics, from the uh, fluctuations, say, of the inflaton field. But tensor perturbations are basically coming really from the quantum fluctuations of the polarized mode of the graviton. So in a sense, I would say that B modes would be really a signature of perturbative quantum gravity. But we don't know if quantum gravity exists. I mean, I, I myself from the quantum gravity community, so I like very much quantum gravity and I usually advocate in favor of quantum gravity. But if we are absolutely no proof that quantum gravity do exist and it could be that gravity is simply not quantized, for example, because it is an emergent phenomenon. And if gravity is not quantized, you just don't expect any B mode at all. And this is also a way to evade this uh, constraint. Okay, so uh, what do we need? Well, we take usual uh, Boltzmann distribution, very standard physics. You uh, relate the amount of uh, the radiation density to the temperature, the Hubble rate to the temperature, and you make very, very textbook mathematics, and you end up with an evaluation of the density of relics today as a function of the parameter. And you see that for some values of the rating temperature, this is in the Planck unit, so around between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 3, you can have a density which is of order 1. You might be frightened by fine tuning. I will come back to that in a minute. But you see at least that it is possible. Of course, if the rating temperature decreases a lot, you have a huge exponential suppression for the obvious reason that the exponential suppression is there and your amount of relics goes to zero. But at least for some values of TRH, uh, you can have a huge amount of relics. This is a zoom and this is the uh, variation of the parameter as a function of the threshold energy. And the threshold energy could vary because some non-perturbative process could decrease it by say one order of magnitude. And this would of course have a huge effect on the uh, necessary rating temperature. So let me come back to conclude probably to this fine tuning issue. Uh, as you can, as you have seen from this plot, we need fine tuning. If you vary a little the rating temperature, you vary a lot the amount of Planck relics dark matter. You can do the mathematics and you, you, you check that you need fine tuning. Is this a problem? Here, I think we have to take 30 seconds for a philosophical uh, thought. Um, the problem of fine tuning, in my opinion, is there when you need to fine tune a parameter with respect to a state which is a priori specific. In cosmology, for sure, the value omega equal one is specific. This is uh, the flat geometry. Uh, any other value of omega would lead to a curved geometry. So clearly, omega equal one is something specific, intrinsically specific. However, as we all know, uh, obviously, inflation fixes omega equal one. Omega equal one just because inflation was there. And there is nothing magic here because if we change something, as omega is defined with respect to the critical density, which itself depends on the Hubble rate, uh, it, the, the model automatically adjusts itself. Not this model, I mean the cosmological model, automatically adjusts itself. So if we change in this model, the amount, the, the, any value like the rating temperature, we still have omega equal one. So we still have the specific state, which is obviously an attractor just because of inflation. On the other hand, you could argue that the matter density, the equilibrium, equilibrium time, etc., would be different. And this is correct. 
But this is not a problem because, in my view at least, because the dark matter density we have in this universe, the equilibrium time and so on and so forth, and all the other contingent parameters have no specific value. In, we could very well live in a world with an equilibrium, equilibrium time which was 10 times higher or smaller. The equilibrium time we, we face in the real universe has nothing special. So here we are just saying that if we change the initial conditions, we change the final state. This is not a problem at all. This is a problem only if you lose a very specific state. So the specific state is not lost, but of course the contingent uh, state uh, is, um, is lost. And in my opinion, there is no fine tuning issue in this specific case. So to uh, come now to the detectability, because of course any model is, uh, is interesting only if we can uh, probe it by experiment. Obviously, testing this idea is challenging, just because you know there is nothing worse to detect than a Planck relic. A Planck relic has a weight of a grain of dust and no other interaction than gravity. So I think you cannot imagine anything which interacts in a weaker way. So um, you can try, for example, to estimate what happens when a Planck relic crosses the Earth. Would something happen? And the result is no, nothing at all happens. Just because uh, um, even though you don't have a catastrophic decrease of the gray body factor, which happens for higher spins, uh, even for fermions, your uh, cross section is of the order of 10 to the minus 66 uh, square centimeter. This is zero, absolutely nothing happened. In addition, you have a very low density because you see, seen from, um, from a gravitational view, the Planck mass is extremely small, but seen from a particle physics point of view, the Planck mass is extremely high. And therefore you need only 10 to the minus 18 relics per cubic centimeter. It means that you have one relic per volume of a million times the planet Earth. So the density will come for dark matter, I mean, the density is extraordinarily small, the cross section is extraordinarily small, and you will never see anything. Except if you take into account the possible merging of Planck mass relics during the entire history of the universe. So you can uh, estimate this, uh, assuming once again that our density is a dark matter density, and then take into account the uh, quantum that will be emitted for this formed black hole to relax to its equilibrium state. The results are not so good, but not so bad. For detectors like OG, the cosmic ray detector, the expected flux is too small. You, you will not see anything. For usual like instruments, that is instruments that would be on the space station and looking at the Earth, you might have something like a fraction of an event per Sorry, year. Million. You have a two yeah. minutes. Uh, okay, 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 so I, I have finished. Mm -hmm. And so, but if you consider very long run experiments like cosmic ray detectors looking at planet Jupiter, uh, you might have a dozen of events per year. So I think I finished, yes, I have finished. So I would not bet my life on this model, okay? Uh, I just find it quite funny that uh, there is no new particles here. There is no new physics. It's completely standard physics, except for the higher than usual energy scale of inflation. So the probability for this model to be true is probably small, but I think it is less strange that quite a lot of dark matter model we see in our everyday life. Thank you. Okay, thank you Aurelien uh, for this uh, talk on this new uh, candidate that I didn't know, uh, dark matter, I have to admit. And Nobody, <laughs> don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I have never heard this work, so. Okay. Um, is there any question? We have min some minutes for questions and then, yes, Rodrigo, please. I was just wondering how, um, I mean, did, what sort of variation in mass could one expect from, from processes such as the, that would give rise to this? Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, be, what? Is it I essentially, did, um, did, you know, yeah. a, a single mass uh, for, uh, presumably not, right? What was the question, Rodrigo? I don't know if uh, we get it. I, I couldn't hear the beginning of the question, please, excuse me. Okay, yeah, so I was, uh, yeah, so uh, I, it's, it's really uh, it's really interesting this idea. But I, I was just wondering what uh, you know, what, how large a spectrum of mass one could expect. 
Okay, it depends whether you, you speak of the initial mass spectrum of the formed black hole or the final spectrum of the relics. The final spectrum of the relics is expected to be picked exactly at the, at the minimum Planck. allowed mass, which is maybe the Planck mass, maybe a fraction of the Planck mass, maybe twice the Planck mass, but which is assumed to be of the order of the Planck mass. So then you really have a peak at this mass. As far as the initial spectrum is concerned, uh, I expect something which is also quite big to this value because we have an exponential suppression in the way of the tail above the Planck mass. So we have a distribution, but it will very, very fast relax to, 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 to this peak. Because you know, if you form a black hole, which is, I don't know, maybe 10 times the Planck mass, in 10 Planck times, it, uh, it evaporates to, to its minimum mass. So very fast, the initial spectrum should converge to this, um, to this shape. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, I, at the same time, uh, is, is there any possibility? Uh, have you thought about like dynamical friction effects or something like that? That's very interesting. Uh, I have thought about that, but I have no answer to, to give you. But that's definitely a good point. Uh, well, I, I have some comments. I can, well, but uh, for example, regarding this last question, the densities you have shown in the last slides implies that the uh, dynamical friction will be really, you have to go to extremely large scales to see something. And no, no so, I agree with that. I agree with that. But then this is one criticism I, I, I will make to, to this kind of model because uh, you probably know that there are quite, I don't know, tight constraints. I, I, will, I was about to say strong, but let me say tight constraint on the local dark matter density in the solar neighborhood. And this, uh, which is um, many orders of magnitude above, I think you have shown. Uh, there are kinematicals and dynamical uh, constraint on the local dark matter density, you can check. Uh, so I don't know, it is uh, the, 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 the masses of the particles implies that, as you have said, that uh, that what? That the density is one particle in a volume of? No, I, I mean, this, just, this is just uh, taking the, uh, the average dark matter density in the galaxy and taking into account the mass, which is huge, because we usually deal with, I don't know, TV mass or something like that. And here we have 10 to the 15 TV particles because they are Planck mass. So I, I just wanted to make the point that the number density is just extremely small because each particle has a huge mass. Ah, so, the number density, sorry. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, I yeah. thought you talk about uh, uh, mass density. Yeah, yeah. The, the mass is, is whatever you want. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of the mass. Okay, so then, uh, no, sorry, the line is understood. But then I have, I have a question. So when you said w the temperature at which these relics, parentheses, assume it, is uh, that that when evaporates or a point you end up with this relic that uh, I think is impossible to know given that uh, uh, given that uh, at that scale you don't know what is the the theory underlying of gravity at this scale so but let's say you assume that you end up with that relic the assumption but then you have this a temperature of decoupling at some of, right of uh, from the from this uh, very primordial plasma and so how do you know which will be the effects on leptogenesis biogenesis bbn now uh, every every relic of dark matter will affect at least the, the ones i know or the, the standard ones affect this one and you have to always check for this in order not to spoil the biogenesis Sure, sure. I completely agree with that, but I expect in this case the effect to be extremely small because you really, you really have to think about something which is incredibly neutral. For example, when you form uh, primordial black holes by usual phenomena, as you said, we have very strong constraints, for example, coming from nucleosynthesis because you don't want to emit over entropy, you don't want to make photo dissociation of light elements and so on and so forth. In that case, you have something which is just dust. It's, it's just dust with no interaction with the outside world. You know, the cross section is basically zero. Mm, okay. So yes. I expect everything to be extremely small. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. This is, is, is like extremely non interactive uh, besides extremely gravity small. with, with any. With 10 anything. to the minus 66 square centimeters. That's zero. But then the question is 
would be interesting if this node tracking the, maybe the test for checking uh, something is when it relaxes. If you assume it relaxes to form a halo somehow, then you can work out the, the, the equilibrium solutions for these uh, very tiny massive particles to see what uh, um, uh, configuration you obtain. For example, you know, a, a fuzzy dark matter obtains a given configuration for this 10 to the minus 20 electron volt. Uh, well, fermions for Kev, you obtain another, and in your case, uh, you probably will obtain. Well, you have to you this you can check. At least you have we have a prediction on the halo morphology out of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, I, a, it's a suggestion. Uh, yeah. Well, this has to be done. Okay, okay. Thank you, Aurelian. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And then we can I think we, we can move to the discussion session and. I would like to to start with Rodrigo, who was the first talk. And uh, if someone has a, a question or comments to Rodrigo's talk, because I had a couple which couldn't do, of course, because of lack of time. But uh, if anyone has a question, well, if not, I would like to. Uh, ask something that was related at some point what you said, Rodrigo, about the equilibrium. Yeah, the, 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 so the question is, um, there have been claims from recent work of Erkal et al. Uh, that uh, by checking the effect of large Magellanic cloud in the equilibrium of the Milky Way, they concluded that uh, roughly above 30 kiloparsec the halo should be out of equilibrium. And this very, was very interesting when I saw this work because, uh, you know, every model of dark matter halos are um, always supposed, uh, you, people make this assumption and then you obtain the profiles and you do the, the, the phenomenology. But if this, have, it would be very important to know for sure, try to constrain as much as possible from observations uh, after which radio you are out of equilibrium. So, I don't know, from, from stellar streams, uh, is there any possibility to try to uh, um, attack this point? Well, but this is exactly what, we, what we're trying to do with this machine learning approach, right? Okay, uh, okay. So, so yeah. the you idea really is to be able to use these, uh, these streams in order to, um, to determine what the, uh, how, how to do the canonical transformation from positions, velocities to actions and angles and have that as um, as with, with its with its time information. So you do that now, and you can do it in the past, and then you should be able to see how that uh, how that change of you know the the accretion of the LMC or whatever how that's affected the mass distribution locally. Uh -huh. That that's that's the that's the long term uh, goal, right? Ah, okay. So you you don't have you you still don't have uh, some um, I know uh, preliminary. Uh... No, we've done it with toy, with toy models. So with toy models, it works, right? Yeah. Um, now doing the whole thing together, the, the, the problem is that we're missing a lot of information, uh, especially uh, like the distances are kind of crap. <laughs> ah, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the radio velocities are largely missing. So for, for most of the stars, I mean, we, because we have something probably like many tens of thousands of stars and streams now. Um, but okay. um, only something like 700 have radio velocity measurements. Oh, I so, see. Uh, so re re related to this point, I, I guess, because is there another related question is, is there any chance using streams? I mean, qualitatively, of course, so, but is there any chance quantitatively to constrain the, the tail of the halo, of a given halo, the, the you know the, the the trend of the tail in the outermost parts. Uh, I don't I don't know if you follow my, if this is power law, which power law. Um, I don't know if you get my question. For example, to test I don't know uh, uh, yes. tails yes. or other tails, which really yes. depend on how big. You, you mean the like. profile, right? Yeah, yeah, the outermost profile or the, 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 the profile. Yeah, no, I I, I think that. That should be doable, um, and, and it'll just get better with the with the future releases of Gaia. I think. Nice. I mean, currently we're we're sort of we're limited, um, probably something like thirty kpc, uh, uh -huh. 
uh, with good data and then it sort of gets worse. We, we see much further with these very massive streams, but they're, they're kind of difficult. I mean, there's um, there's a stream of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which- Ah, yeah, 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 we have used that. But, yeah, but, but it's a very complicated structure that is difficult to, to understand. Well, so, but already, already between, be, already between, let me think, yes, already between 20 and 30 kiloparsec, if you, um, where you said you can have some reliable data, you can put some interesting constraints already because, uh, for example, from core profiles, this already is falling down to the tail and uh, and that you can then compare with this uh, power law of NFW, uh, for example. Well, hopefully. I mean, uh, one of my collaborators is really interested also in the superfluid dark matter, and there you mm -hmm. can expect it's, it's roughly at the right yes. third as well. well this, was what, uh, good. this was my comment before. We were trying, one of the objectives of our work with streams that we also like to test uh, these, uh, because there are, as you said, the um, candidate of dark matter, for example, in our case of fermions, or mainly in, in, in more interestingly, in the general cases of relaxation out of maximization entropy principles, you end up with tails which are uh, uh, polytropic. Uh, and then it's, uh, a difference with the power loss. Uh, and then I think this would be interesting also to test. Uh, we, are, we are interested in that uh, because our model has this behavior in the outermost part. Uh, okay. Then we can maybe, I, I, I would like them to share uh, probably a, a work of ours on, on this uh, topic. So we, we can say later, good, thank you. So, okay, um, there is, uh, I think, uh, well, there were some questions to the talk of Patrika, but uh, she had, she she has to leave. She had to leave. So, does anyone have any other question on any other talk? If not, I have a question for scalar field dark matter to Jordi. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I have a couple of questions that we can do because of time. Actually, I have a question on that one as well. If I good, if you want to start, because kind of I forgot the, my question. Yes, yeah, so, so I was wondering with that the um, so it, so that 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 model doesn't necessarily um, account for the the rotation that we see in the in the satellite population, right? Um, uh, well, the, the orbital poles are accumulated in some regions, uh, and so but this so you could don't be get the motion, right? You, you don't the, get the sort of uh, the, the the bulk rotation that we seem to see. Um, Presumably, no, not like that just uh, some probability of the accumulation of the orbital poles. Yeah. Although the, the test particles are uh, in plain trajectories. But you could imagine some system like what you're saying, suppose, and then feed it, right? If you, if you fed it with, you know, from in, say like in the standard model you, you have, or um, objects coming down the, the filaments, right? Um, and so if you have a pre-existing uh, structure, the, then maybe that would give you an automatic way to have things coming in on with, with a, a preferential sense of rotation. Uh, I'm sorry. And, and staying there. <laughs> What's the question again? No, I, I would, I mean, because if the um, you know if the satellites are accreting along filaments uh, and they are arriving onto a system which has uh, your uh, your the mass distribution that you that you show, then perhaps you could 
you know, you retain the, the you know, that concentration of orbital poles and get the, the right sense of rotation or get a coherent sense of rotation on average or something. Yeah, yes, I suppose. Mm. Mm, we haven't done that. Uh, we only uh, model the satellites as particles, as the test particles. So that's all we have yet. Thanks. Okay. Um, that's any uh, anyone has another question? Uh, yes, I want to comment. Well, first one comment that these these assumptions of uh, uh, imposing, let's say, or assuming that your your solitonic uh, state psi. Right, because your solution you're using is solitonic, right? Of your Schrodinger Poisson. Uh, the no, solitonic the is only the, it's an equilibrium configuration, but no, not only the solitonic, ah. solitonic state. Okay. There are you two have, states. You have the atmosphere as well, the atmosphere of the other occupation. Yes. State. Okay, so, so, the uh, I will you should check I think the what I think this was the first ever paper analyzing the um, effect of excited state on Klein Gordon equation Einstein Klein Gordon equation which was Ruffini Bonasola 1969 you yeah. can check he he was the first one and I think um, he concluded some points regarding the effects on the equation of a state due to the excited state. And I should check again that, but I will have in mind that these uh, excited states, because generally you work with the ground state. Uh, yeah. uh, so I don't see if it is, if it is self-consistent to, to, to assume freely the, that you have uh, this element uh, contribution to different uh, orders. So I, I think maybe, maybe, maybe it is possible, but uh, I think you should check this for consistency. I don't know. Um, well, this is just a comment. Yes, I will check. And another question is, do you, do you know the relaxation? You know, these halos, because you show equilibrium configuration, right? You show yes. equilibrium configuration. An important question when you use uh, halos out of these, uh, let's say, first principle or elementary particle based halos, one important question is how they relax. For example, uh, in the case of Schrodinger Poisson, they relax of a mechanism called uh, Gravitational gravitational cool. cooling. Gravitational cooling? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but then, do you know, I mean, how this excited state play the role in the, in the, in the relaxation process with respect to the original version uh, of the of the ground state uh, solution? Sorry, I don't know if we lost. George, are you there? 